now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. And we close out the last weekend of June with a mixed bag of summer fun with Boston Blackie, The Whistler, The Magnificent Montague, My Friend Irma, and Superman. That's all straight ahead on this Sunday, 30th day of June, 182nd day of the year, 184 days left till we get to 2024. French acrobat Charles Blondin walked across Niagara Falls on a tightrope on this date in 1859. His real name, Jean-Francois Gravier. In 1908, a powerful natural explosion from an unknown cause rocked the Tungusa Basin in eastern Siberia, flattening hundreds of square miles of forest and resulting in tremors that could be felt hundreds of miles away. In 1921, President Harding appointed former President Taft chief of the U.S. Chief Justice of the U.S., I should say. Uh, it was on this date in 1934, Adolf Hitler secured his position in the Nazi party by a blood purge, ridding the party of other leaders such as Ernest Röhm and Kurt von Schlichter. In 1936, Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind was published. Fred, you go. Where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Those immortal words from Gone with the Wind. The pub book was published on this date in 1936. President Truman ordered U.S. ground forces into the Korean conflict on this date in 1950. And in 1953, the very first production Corvette built at the General Motors facility in Flint, Michigan. The men who designed this had fun. And the builders and the testers had fun. And while it's never going to take the place of the family car, I, for one, am going to have a lot of fun owning it. Now this could never have happened unless the world's largest manufacturer of automobiles had put its tremendous resources back of the job of designing and building a sports car to uphold American leadership in every field of transportation. They built her to handle like an angel with every ounce of weight right where it belongs for perfect balance, clean and sleek and efficient looking and light and strong. And they kept the cockpit simple and practical. For the power plant, they started with the finest valve and head engine. Some extra special features of higher compression, triple side draft carburetors, and dual exhaust give her 160 horsepower. Naturally, the automatic transmission quadrants on the floor. That's in keeping with sports car tradition. In addition to the speedometer, there's a tachometer to measure engine revolutions. They call her Corvette. And she belongs to the highway, just for the sheer and simple joy of driving. For the open road and the country byway. For Mr. and Mrs. America in a carefree mood. Boy, what a car. A 1954 Corvette commercial voiced by NBC Today show host Dave Garraway. In 1976, the 26th Amendment to the Constitution, which lowered the voting age to 18, ratified by the states. Some 11 million young men and women who have participated in the life of our nation through their work, their studies, and their sacrifices for its defense are now to be fully included in the electoral process. For more than 20 years, I have advocated the 18-year-old vote. I heartily congratulate our young citizens on having gained this right. President Nixon congratulating the newly enfranchised voters. In 1975, on this date, President Reagan announced the release of American hostages from Lebanon. The 39 Americans held hostage for 17 days by terrorists in Lebanon are free, safe, and at this moment on their way to Frankfurt, Germany. They'll be home again soon. 
The president added that the U.S. would fight back against terrorists for attacks on American citizens and property. In 1998, the remains of a Vietnam War serviceman buried in the tomb of the unknown soldier identified as those of Air Force pilot Michael J. Blassie. Nineteen firefighters died on this date in 2013, controlling a wildfire in Yarnell, Arizona. And it was on this date five years ago today, President Trump became the first sitting president to visit the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea. Passing away on this date in history, a gentleman whom you probably don't know by name, but you know by work, James DeWar. No, not spirits. No, no, no. This is the guy who invented the Twinkie. As America's favorite snack cake, the Twinkie stands alone. Twinkie. Sweet sensation. We're all happy that Hostess was rescued, but more happy that James DeWar bore passing away on this date in 1985, but left behind the Twinkie for us to enjoy. Also passing away on this date, Lee DeForest, electronics inventor. He had a lot to do with television and radio in its current state. Also Spanky, George McFarlane from the Our Gang Comedies passing away on this date. The delightful Gail Gordon. Uh, we've had so many good shows of his. Uh, I've, I've got to remember to try to find some episodes of Granby's Green Acres so you can hear him in his solo starring role. You heard him earlier in the audition program for the Halls of Ivy a few days back. Uh, also passing away on this date, guitarist Chet Atkins and uh, uh, Buddy Hackett. Very, 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 very funny man. Birthdays today include... A couple of pro wrestlers of note, Man Mountain Dean, one of the first really huge guys, and uh, Ed Strangler Lewis, whose uh, headlock uh, caused havoc in the wrestling industry. Also, uh, actress Susan Hayward, actress singer Lena Horn, magician Harry Blackstone, Florence Ballard of the Supremes, and another great wrestler who left us a year ago, Terry Funk. He was born on this date in history. He passed away last year at the age of 79 after going through serious health issues. He wrestled until he was in his 70s, if you can believe it. Hi, this is Jeff Foxworthy. It is now time for the birthday announcements. The following people are now officially older than dirt. Ted Knight's wife and two clothes for comfort, Nancy, Nancy Dussault, is 87 today. The fellow who played Steve Rhodes on Married with Children, David Garrison, also from In Living Color and Jumanji, David Allen Greer, 68, from Med in Black and Full Metal Jacket, Vincent D'Ofriano is uh, 65 today. Boxer Mike Tyson is 58 and he's getting ready to get in a boxing ring again. Can you believe it? I can't, but he's a beast. From uh, Patch Adams, Saw, and Head Over Heels, Monica Potter is 53. And uh, some pro wrestlers of note. Dax Harwood from AEW, a part of uh, FTR, uh, is 40 years old today. Former EVP of AEW, now the WWE Heavyweight Champion, Cody Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes' son is 39. And pro wrestler Alicia Fox is 38. Those just a few of the people who celebrate the last day of June as their birthday. If this is your birthday... Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say... Happy birthday to you! And on this Sunday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we'll get started with the Summer Replacement Series. Chester Morris, who played Boston Blackie in the movies, played Boston Blackie on the radio. And uh, here's it. We're going to go back 80 years to June 30th, 1944, for an episode of the Summer Replacement for Amos and Andy, Boston Blackie. That's next on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. There is a defense against radioactive fallout. During enemy attack, get to a shelter immediately. Stay there until local officials advise you it's safe to leave. Be prepared. 
Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues now, a summer replacement series. This one for Amos and Andy. And you can imagine people carrying the yucks and chortles and jokes of of uh, uh, Amos and Andy. And imagine hearing the shoot 'em up of Chester Morris as Boston Blackie. Yes, the uh, motion picture star Chester Morris, who played Blackie in the movies, uh, played Ch- played the Blackie in this uh, short run series. This episode was from 80 years ago, June 30th, 1944, and it's about a hundred thousand dollar business note. 10 p.m. Eastern War Time. Your dial is set at 660. W-E-A-F, New York. Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso presents Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. Is Mr. Manletter there? Why, no, I'm sorry, he's not. This is his secretary, Miss Rochelle. Can I help you? Yes, you can deliver a message for me. I've been trying to reach him all day. This is John Partridge, president of the Morton National Bank. Mr. Partridge, but... Well, Arthur Borden is president of the Morton Bank, isn't he? Not since yesterday, he's not. Give this message to Mr. Manletter, please. Tell him that his notes to the bank were due and payable on Monday of this week, and we must have our money. But, Mr. Partridge, we... We showed our books to Mr. Borden only last week, and he agreed to extend the notes until our accounts receivable came in. Our business is in fine shape, Mr. Partridge. Our books prove it. Please tell Mr. Manletter that we'll accept our money in the morning, Miss Rochelle. But it's $100,000. We can't possibly raise that money overnight. I'm sorry. That's Mr. Manletter's problem. Goodbye. $100,000. Hello, Jean. Mr. Manletter, the bank just called. There's a new president and they... And they want to foreclose on my notes. How did you know? Read this letter I got at the house this morning. Here, read it. If you want to know how to prevent the bank from foreclosing on your note, have your friend Boston Blackie visit a house at 50 Hunter Street at 7 o'clock this evening. Signed a friend. Mr. Manletter, what does that mean? I don't know. I can't see any connection between the bank and Blackie. But I do know I won't ask him to go to Hunter Street. Well, can we raise $100,000 for the notes overnight? Uh, I don't think so, but I'll try. Only there isn't much hope. Then you must call your friend Blackie. No, it can only mean trouble for Blackie. I don't know how or why, but it must be trouble for him if I'm being forced to ask him to go there. But Blackie thrives on trouble, Mr. Manletter, and it'll save your business. No, I won't call Blackie. I'm going out to try to raise the money. You'll hear from me later. All right, sir. Alice... Will you call a number for me, please? Get me Boston Blackie. Get me Boston Blackie. Four words that the weak use to call their champion. You know, some expressions seem so natural and right, we use them all the time without even thinking, like ruby red and sky blue and so on. Well, what I get a particular kick out of is the fact that we've added a new one to the nation's vocabulary. Yes, I hear tell that nowadays you ladies say rinse white when you want to talk about really white clothes. Of course, there's a mighty good reason why Rinso gets your clothes so white. Rinso's soapy rich suds won't take no for an answer from dirt. They pitch right in in your tub or washer and go to town. Yes, Rinso gets out more dirt. And that's why you ladies are able to turn out those beautiful Rinso white, Rinso bright washes. So, next wash day, whistle for the kind of wash you're proud to hang on your line. Like this. And remember, it stands for Rinso White. Now, meet Chester Morris as Boston Blackie. Tell me, Blackie, which one of these girls do you like best? So, come on, take a look at their pictures. Come on, will you? <laughs> All right, Shorty. I'll judge your personal beauty contest for you. Now, this blonde here... Yeah. Hold it, Shorty. I'll get the phone. Hello? Blackie? Yes. Blackie, this is Jean. I had to call you. 
Mr. Manletter's in terrible trouble. Hey, come on, will you, Blackie? Come on, get off that phone. I gotta know about this redhead. Lay off, Shorty. Uh, what is it, Jean? What's the matter with Arthur? The bank called an hour ago. I've been trying since then to reach you. They're going to take over the business if Arthur doesn't redeem his notes for $100,000 by tomorrow morning. Well, they, they, they can't do that, Jean. Yes, they can. The notes are overdue. Hey, boss, what about this brunette? Now, come on, come on, will you? Quiet. Uh, not you, Jean. Uh, look, honey, I haven't anywhere near 100000 and I wouldn't know where to go to get it by tomorrow morning. I didn't expect you would, Blackie, but Mr. Manletter received a message saying that if you come to 50 Hunter Street at, 12, at 7 o'clock tonight, the notes will be renewed. If I go to 50 Hunter Street, well, what does that mean? I don't know, Blackie. But if I show up, they'll renew? That's what the note says. Mr. Manletter knew you'd be in some kind of danger if you went, and he wouldn't ask you. Oh, don't worry, Chick. You'll hear from me. Bye. So you finally got done. Now, come on, help me. Look at it. See, I got 50 pictures here. Pick out the one I should pin up on my I wall. I can't do anything about your pin-up problem now, Shorty. Oh. I've got something at 50 Hunter Street that I've got to pin down. <laughs> Hey, what is this? Sounds like a record. Hey, you behind that desk. You in the mask. What is this? Come on, talk. First of all, Boston Blackie, don't try anything foolish. There's one of my men behind you with a gun. Now that you've turned around to see, <laughs> let me tell you that you are listening to this recording which I made because I don't want you to know what my voice sounds like in person. A record, huh? Well, personally, I prefer Harry James. Jackie, I want you to listen carefully to what follows. Have you anything to say? Sure I have. I hope you'll... Oh! Okay, boss. Take the record off. He's out cold. I uh, hope I didn't hit him too hard, boss. There's no sense killing him. The law is going to do that for us very soon. <laughs> Gee, Blanky, where you been? I've been having pups. Well, I hope they look like their mother. Well, I'm back, Shorty, only I'm not the same guy. You should have had your head examined for going down to that Hunter Street joint. Yes, I, I had it cracked. That's worse. Take a look at this, Shorty. A bullet hole? Yeah. Yeah, cold pocket. Who'd you shoot, Blanky? I didn't shoot anybody, Shorty. Somebody slugged me, and when I woke up, my gun was gone, and this hole was in my pocket. I must have been out for hours. It's, uh, it's almost 11 o'clock. I called Jean, and she told me the bank renewed man letters notes the minute I showed up at the Hunter Street place. Somebody sure took an awful crack at you, eh, Blanky? Yeah, it's more than that, Shorty. Only how much more and exactly what, I don't know. Uh, get my robe, will you please? Yeah, yeah, sure, boss. Uh, give me your coat, and I'll hang it over this here chair. Well, here it is. Blanky, uh, what do you make of this business this afternoon? Oh, I don't make it. It's got me stumped. Yeah, me too. Well, here's your robe. Thanks. Please. I think I'll lie down and relax for half an hour. Uh, would you mind fixing me some coffee, oh, Shorty? Sure, sure. Have it for you in just a minute, boss. Thanks. Hello, Blackie. Glad to see me? Well, Inspector Faraday, of course I'm glad to see you. <laughs> Which goes to prove how easy I am to please. <laughs> Very funny. Now, Blackie, I think you overdid it this afternoon. Well, my head sure feels like I did. That isn't what I mean. Did you ever hear of a private detective named Fred Visual? That crooked jammer? Yeah. Oh, sure, I've heard of him. And he's heard of me, too, Faraday. I got the guy's license suspended when he tried to blackmail me. Uh, oh, a couple of friends of mine, you know, last year. That's the guy. He didn't like you, Blackie. You know, I'd feel a whole lot worse if you said Rita Hayworth didn't like me. You didn't like him either. I hate rats, Faraday. Come on, what's all this about? Nothing, only Visual was found shot to death an hour ago. What? Huh? I'm taking you in for his murder, Blackie. Now, let's get going. Now, look, Faraday, you've done ridiculous things every day of your life. <laughs> but right now, you're borrowing from next week. What makes you think I bumped off Visual? I don't think it, I know it. We've got your gun and it's got your fingerprints on it. Oh. We found it near Visual's body. And if I'm not mistaken, isn't that a bullet hole in the pocket of this coat of yours on the chair? You fired from your pocket. Well, maybe I burned the hole with a cigarette. Uh, no cigarette ever burned a hole like that. Now, come on, let's get going, Blackie. Get dressed and hurry up. Take off that rope, put a coat on. You're coming with me. Come on, take that robe off. All right, all right. Pretty robe, isn't it? Too bad you won't be allowed to wear it in jail. You like this robe, Inspector? Mm -hmm. Well, here, take a good look at Lovely. it. Lovely. Take a good look at it. Right over your head. <laughs> Shorty. Shorty. Yeah, yeah, I'm right here, boss. I was waiting for a signal for him before I caught him. Well, help me tie him up, Shorty. We'll use the cord from the rope. Now, quiet, Inspector, quiet. Don't you know it's impolite to talk with your mouth full? Uh, you'll be tied up like a chicken in just a little minute now. Uh, well, I know what the score is now, Shorty. Somebody's fixed it to look like I knocked off Fred Visual. Yeah, I heard. 
Ain't a very pretty picture, is it, boss? I'm not worried about the picture, Shorty. I'm worried about the frame. Who is it? Who's there? Let me in, Gene. Hurry. It's Blackie. Blackie? Oh, thanks. I... I'm sorry about coming to your apartment at this hour, Jean, but I couldn't reach you on the telephone. Well, they closed the downstairs switchboard at midnight. Oh. What is it, Blackie? What's wrong? I need information, Jean. I need all you know or can remember. There's some connection between a private detective named Fred Viswell and somebody at the Morton National Bank. Now, who was it that spoke to you on the telephone? The new president. Oh. His name is John Partridge. Well, that's the man I'm going to see. Faraday's on my trail again, Jean, and I've got to clear myself. Oh, you'll never be able to get into the bank to see Partridge, especially if Faraday has a dragnet out for you. As soon as you show up, they'll throw you in jail. Oh, don't worry. I'll figure out a way to get in to see him. But if I don't get anywhere with Partridge, I'm a dead duck. Good morning, Mr. Partridge. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Partridge. Good morning. Oh, I left you a mail on your desk, Mr. Partridge. Thank you. I'll be in my office if anyone wants me. Don't open your mouth, Partridge, or this gun will shut it permanently. Why? What? What do you want? Aren't you one of the special police that protects the bank? Oh, well, don't let this uniform fool you. I wore it just to get in here. And keep away from your desk. You know, I'm allergic to the sudden pushing of buttons. Ah, that's better. Now, do you know who I am? No. I'm Boston Blackie. That doesn't mean a thing to me. Oh, I think it does. You called Arthur Manletter's office and told him the bank wouldn't renew his notes. But he received a letter saying that if I were to go to 50 Hunter Street, the bank would renew. Maybe you know what you're talking about, but I don't. You've got to be the man behind a pretty shrewd frame-up, Partridge. Unless you're acting on somebody's instructions. Now, which is it? You know that if I raised my voice, you'd be shot dead by the bank guards before you could go through the front door? Well, I'd have company, Partridge. Believe me, you. Inspector Faraday thinks I killed a man. They don't hang you twice for a double killing. Why was I framed for the murder of Fred Viswell? I don't know any Fred Viswell, and I don't know anything about any telephone call that was supposed to be made by me to Arthur Manletter. No, you don't, huh? How about the renewal of Manletter's note? There never was any question about renewing Manletter's note. His credit is excellent. The note was renewed by me personally at 10 o'clock yesterday morning with a notary attesting to the time. And that was certainly long before my alleged phone call. Oh, you played it cozy, huh? You knew Manletter would call me, so you bluffed him. How long are you going to make me stand here? Can't you see there's nothing I know that can help you? Why don't you go? I will. I've got another stop to make. But the minute I leave this office, you'll call for help, of course. Of course. Oh, but you're not going to. Oh. You know, the only way you can do any calling, Partridge, is to talk in your sleep. <laughs> Mr. Borden? Yes? I'm sorry to disturb you at your home. My name is Boston Blackie. How do you do, Mr. Blackie? I, uh, I came up here to see you, Mr. Borden, uh, about your bank. You mean about what used to be my bank? I'm sorry. Uh, who decided to replace you as president? The board of directors. Oh, and was it done suddenly? Yes, very. Uh-huh, and, uh, where did John Partridge come from? I don't know. He had been on our board of directors only a short while. Oh. I'm an old man, Blackie. The loss of my bank was a blow to me. Everything came so suddenly, I hadn't gotten used to not being there anymore. Will you forgive me if I'd rather not talk about it? Oh, I understand, Mr. Borden. I, I'm going to try to get your bank back for you, but I need some help. Now, here's an address where I can be reached. Oh, you must have some loyal employee at the bank you can depend on, and would you call him and get him to find out something about Partridge? And if you get any information, send me a message. And uh, send that ring you're wearing with it so I know it's from you. I'll send you a message if I get it. But with just a paper clip on it, I haven't been able to get this ring off in years. The paper clip will identify my messenger, if I hear anything. Good. Give me a little help. I'll turn a murder over to Inspector Faraday, get rid of the charge against myself, and give you a bank right in your side pocket. <laughs> We've got to stay down here at my waterfront hideout during the day, Shorty. Every cop in town is on our tail. And Faraday's sworn he won't sleep till he brings me in. It's okay with me, Blackie. 
uh, and go ahead. It's your deal. You got me, let me see, you got me 60 to 17 and two boxes. Go ahead. It's your deal. <laughs> you know one thing about gin rummy, it sure passes the time away. Yeah, it passes my dough away, too. <laughs> okay, you two. Hoist him. Come on, Patsy. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Now, look, Lucky, stand up and don't try no, no, nothing foolish. I, I know all about you and your trucks. Well, I wasn't exactly going to ask you to pick a card. Who are you? A guy who ain't going to be outsmarted by you. Oh? Tie the little guy up, Patsy. Yeah, yeah, I'll tie him up. Good, too. Don't talk. Tie. I, I'm tying him. He ain't going to go nowhere for a while. Okay. Now, well, suppose we start moving, Blackie. You ready, Patsy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm ready, Mug. Well, of course, don't anybody ask me. You're ready, Blackie. But you don't know for what. Now, start moving. Oh, this is a ride, huh? Okay. One way? Oh, I wouldn't say that, Blackie. We're coming back, Patsy and me. But we got orders to get you. Orders to get me, huh? Dealing in the Blackie market? You'll strain an arm reaching for jokes like that, Blackie. I thought that was rather clever, isn't But it? you might as well know something. Yeah? We ain't taking you on any gang ride. We're turning you over to the cops. Yeah, I'll bet. A couple of hoods like you wouldn't go within two miles of headquarters. I guarantee Faraday's got charges hanging over both you guys. Maybe. Only he'll be so glad to see you, he won't be able to think straight. All right, let's get moving, Blackie. And remember, I'm the guy that's got the gun on you. Okay, Mug. But take my word for it, someday you're going to beg me to forget that. Blackie, there's something natural about the way you look behind bars. Yeah. They look good on you. Oh, thanks. You've got no idea how nice it is to see you sitting so sweetly in that cell. Now, Faraday, listen. I didn't knock off this one. No kidding. Oh, of course not. And you didn't throw your bathrobe over my head and tie me up either, did you, Blackie? Well, yes, I did do that, mm -hmm. Faraday. You know I did. But I did it to help you. Oh, this is going to be good. Now, tell me how. Well, somebody knocked off Fred Biswell. Your job is to catch murderers, Faraday. I, I had to be free to help you, see? Blackie, you should have been a lawyer. Thanks. Only you're overlooking a slight something. Your gun. Your pretty little gun. With your fingerprints on it. And a slug from it in Viswell's head and a bullet hole in your coat pocket. Nobody else kills Viswell, Blackie. You've got no alibi. You hated the guy and your gun did the job. Looks like kind of a perfect job to me. This is a frame-up, Faraday. Now, you've got to do something you've never done before. Oh, what? Use your head. Look, you're in jail, Blackie, and you tell me to use my head. Don't you think this is a spot where you should use yours? Well, it seems as though Inspector Faraday is about to realize a lifelong ambition and has finally found a charge against Boston Blackie that will stick. However, that remains to be seen, of course. You know, you ladies really have it all over the men, folks, when it comes to being sensible about clothes. Come summertime, for instance, you know that one of the tricks of keeping cool is to look cool. And what could look cooler, crisper, and prettier than those bright cotton washables you wear? It's important, though, to remember to keep them bright and crisp. And that's where our soapy rich Rinso comes in. No point in working your head off in summertime, boiling and scrubbing clothes. And you don't have to with Rinso. A short soaking in Rinso suds, often as little as ten minutes, is enough. Then a few quick finger rubs on extra soiled places, and your clothes are ready to rinse. And believe you me, you'll be mighty proud of how your wash looks, too. Your lovely colored washable cottons will stay fresh and bright week after week, wash after wash. And your white clothes, well, it goes without saying, they'll be... <whistles> yes, Rinso White. So get Rinso next wash day for a Rinso White, Rinso Bright wash. <laughs> And now back to Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. Blackie is in jail. Inspector Faraday knows that it was Blackie's gun that killed Fred Viswell, and Blackie can't clear himself while he's in prison. Into the cell block where Blackie is being kept walks a young lady. The policeman at the end of the corridor said I could come in and talk to all the other policemen in the whole jail, and you're the other policeman, so I thought I'd come over and talk to you. All right, miss. But about what? About the ball, of course. Everybody knows about the ball. What ball? The ball we're giving. But I'm selling tickets only to policemen. Well, now I've heard everything. Selling tickets to policemen for a civilian's ball. How much are they? A dollar. But the policeman at the end of the corridor said that if Look, I came up... Look, uh, here's a dollar and keep the ticket. Uh -huh. And the next policeman is right down past this row of cells. Go bother him, will you, please? Yes. And uh, don't tell me that bag you're carrying is full of tickets. There aren't that many policemen. Oh, you're so silly. Of course not. I always carry a bag. It makes me look as if I'm always about ready to go someplace. Well, uh, you can go right now. I'll unlock the door. You can walk down the corridor till you find another cop at the end of it. Uh, 
His name's Murphy. Isn't every policeman? Oh, I don't know. All right, go. Go on, miss. Right down the corridor. Don't mind them mugs in the cells. Blackie. Jean, what are you doing here? This isn't visiting day. Blackie, listen. I've got to keep walking when the guard looks this way. Oh, oh, don't be silly. Come in. The door's open. The cell door's open? Sure, try it. It is. Blackie, how did you do that? She closed the door. You know, I could open the cell door all right, Jean. That was a cinch. But I haven't figured out yet how to get past the guards at both ends of the guard. Well, stop figuring it, Blackie. Here, look at this bag I brought. It's an outfit that matches the one I'm wearing, only it's a couple of sizes larger. Put it on, quick. What, and leave you in the cell? Oh, nothing doing, honey. Well, I'll go out the door. I came in, Blackie, and you go out the other one. Only hurry. The guard might get curious. Okay, but it won't take me a second. Now, first roll my trousers up, mm-hmm. then I'm going to dress. Oh, oh, you brought a wig, too, huh? You think of everything. Can, uh, can I get into these shoes? Sure, you can. Then hurry, Blackie. Yeah. Don't forget your hat. Say, it's a cute one. All right, zip me up, will you? And all set. <laughs> there. Oh. Now, just walk out, Blackie, and tell a cop the end of the corridor. His name's Murphy. Tell him you ran out of tickets. Uh, can you talk like a girl? Who, me? Of course I oh, can. Oh, you better not talk. Bye, Blackie. Good luck. <laughs> Meet me back in my apartment. Oh, thanks, Jean. You're wonderful. Mm, see you later, Blackie. You look awful cute in that outfit. Watch out for the wolves. Oh, not me. For once, I want to be on the receiving end of a... This is the house, Shorty, 50 Hunter Street. I don't know what I'd expect to find here, but let's go in. Why, boss? Well, maybe I can pick up something inside that'll give me a clue to that masked man. Uh, you see any lights? No. Nope, there ain't anybody. Okay, now don't hit your flashlight, but we close the street door. Oh, what kind of a lock is this? I don't know, but if you're working on it, it's an easy lock. I'll guarantee that. No, Shorty, it's an open lock. Come on in. Shh, quiet. Hit your flash, Shorty. Right. Yeah, this is the room where I got conked. The masked guy sat right over there facing me with his hands folded on that table, and he... Shorty. What? Oh, what happened? I know now who the masked guy was, Shorty. Yeah? I'm going to straighten out this whole mess. Wait till I look up a number in this phone book. Let's see. Yeah, who are you calling, Blackie? I'm calling the murderer of Fred Biswell. Wait a minute. Yeah. Hey, here it is. So well, now let's hope I sound like the mug. Hey, boss, this is a mug. Come right down to Hunter Street House. We got Blackie here. He's Hoyt. Oh, you want to talk to him? Okay. Talk to the boss, Blackie, or you get it again. Here, take the phone. So you're the boss, huh? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Applaud? Hey, give me that phone, Blackie. Okay, boss. Yeah. Yeah, that sure is Blackie, huh? Oh, you'll be right down? Good work, eh? Good. Yeah. What a swell. Okay, Shorty, now you beat it. I'm staying right here, and I'm handling this alone. But I have a job for you when you get outside. Okay, boss. It may decide who dies for the murder of Fred Biswell. And just between us, I'd rather it wasn't me. Mug, Mug, are you in here? Mug, turn on the light. It's dark. I can't see you. Turn on the light. Here's a light, Mr. Borden. Right in your face. Boston Blackie. That's right, Boston Blackie. <laughs> you had a very nice frame-up all fixed for me, but I think you're going down to explain it all to Inspector Faraday now. Do you? Well, I don't. So the phone call to me was a gag, eh? I might have known it was one of your tricks, Blackie, but I didn't. No harm done, though. I'll just leave. Oh, just like that, eh? Mm-hmm. And don't think you can threaten me, Blackie. As long as I'm alive, I'm a potential alibi for you. Only you and I know you didn't kill Fred Biswell and that I did. And you've got to let me live in the hope that someday I'll confess. Mm, Yes, yes, I guess maybe I do. Oh, you're a pretty smart man, Borden. You'd have to be to have me in this kind of a jam. What did Biswell ever do to you? You thought he could outsmart me, the fool. Some private investors had him checking the books at the bank. Found that I'd taken quite a bit of money that didn't belong to me. And he thought he'd try a bit of blackmail. He didn't get very far. Pretty thorough, aren't you? I think so. How did you know I was the masked man, Blackie? Well, two ways, Borden. Yes? One was the fact that I gave you the address of my waterfront hideout, and later your hoods paid me a visit down there. You were the only one that had that address. The other was that ring you're wearing, uh, you know, the one you told me you couldn't take off. When I came in tonight, I remembered the masked man was wearing that ring. You know, 
Putting John Partridge in your place as president of the bank sounds like a wonderfully smart idea. It was. I was tired of working, and I could throw Partridge in jail any time I like for his embezzlement job we did. So he must do as I say. And now, Boston Blackie... Let's go visit Inspector Faraday. Well, no, Mr. Borden. I, I don't think I care to see the inspector tonight. No? Perhaps this gun will make you change your mind. I happen to know that Faraday has your gun. You're still under suspicion of murder, you know. And if you try to escape, Blackie, I'll think nothing of killing you in cold blood. You know, I believe you would, Borden. All right. All right, I'll go with you. I guess I'd rather be a live prisoner than a dead suspect. <laughs> Here's Inspector Faraday's office, Blackie. Walk right in. Go on. Okay, if you say so, Borden. <laughs> Hello, Inspector. Say, look, don't you ever sleep? Oh, Blackie, I've been expecting you. You're a little late. Would you mind telling this gentleman in back of me to get rid of his gun, please, Inspector? He doesn't realize that it's impolite to point. His name is Arthur Borden. Okay, Mr. Borden, I'll take that gun. Certainly. Here you are. Well, looks like I've got a first-rate murder suspect right here in this room. <laughs> it certainly does, Inspector. <laughs> Better lock him up. In just a minute. In fact, I might as well do it very legal and proper. Arthur Borden, you're under arrest for the murder of Fred Viswell. What? Me? Why, I... Save it. I wish it was Blackie. Only it isn't. <laughs> We've got your confession in your own voice, right on a dictograph record. A dictograph planted in my Hunter Street house? Right. That's impossible. Nobody could have put a dictograph in there. You tell him, Blackie. You figured this thing out. Well, before you came into the Hunter Street house tonight, Mr. Borden, I dialed the inspector's private number on the telephone and left the receiver off the hook, you see. I had Shorty call him before and tell him to expect his private telephone to ring. All the while you were telling me how perfectly you would frame me, the inspector was listening on this end. Yeah, not only listening, but having the whole thing taken down on a record. <laughs> uh, say, Inspector, I did you a favor, didn't I, by turning up Visual's murderer? You did yourself a bigger favor, but what's on your mind? Well, I'll tell you, Inspector. Shorty told me you have Jean Rochelle booked here. You said it, Blackie. She helped you escape from jail. Well, maybe she did, but uh, if she did, I brought you in a murderer. So you certainly owe her a favor, too, right? No, oh, maybe. What do you expect me to do, let her go? Sure. You've held her long enough. Now it's my turn. You've heard about making mountains out of molehills, but here's how to make mountains of dishes go right down to nothing in a hurry. You put some rinse on your dishpan, and up go the suds. Plenty of thick suds from surprisingly little rinse and down goes that stack of dishes in practically no time. Yes, dishwashing is a mighty easy, simple job with Rinso helping out. China, silver, glassware, they're all shining brightly in a jiffy with Rinso's soapy rich suds on the job. Why, even your pots and pans come clean easily when Rinso gets to work. Use Rinso, too, for all the soap and water jobs around the house. It's swell. <laughs> a glimpse at next week's adventure of Boston Blackie. All right, Monaghan, give me a little more juice in that light. No, not under that. I can't stand it. That's better. Now, listen, Shorty, you say you don't remember what happened. I, I don't. I keep telling you I don't. All right, maybe you don't remember. You were slugged. Now, we don't want to know anything except one thing. Now, think hard, Shorty. Who was the last person you saw or talked to before you were slugged? Now, that's all we want to know. I'm thinking, Inspector Honest. I'm dizzy trying to think. I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, hey, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, I remember now. The last person I talked to before I got conked was, uh, well, with Boston Blackie. Be sure to listen in at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris with Richard Lane as Inspector Faraday. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Original music for the program was by Charles Cornell. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Rinso, and wishing you all a very pleasant good night. <laughs> Warm weather is ahead, and that means greater danger from perspiration. Protect yourself. Use Life Boy in your daily bath. 
You know, of seven leading brands, Life Boy gives you the most soap for your money. And its rich, purifying Life Boy lather agrees with your skin. And don't forget, Life Boy is the only soap especially made to stop... This is the National Broadcasting Company. While Chester Morris was best known as Boston Blackie in the motion pictures, that was the main thing. He replaced Jack Albertson in the Broadway production of The Subject Was Roses in 1965 and played him in the Turing production in 1966. He was diagnosed in 1968 with stomach cancer, and he did his last work in the 1970 motion picture The Great White Hope. Uh, Morris uh, passed away uh, in 1970. He was just 69 years of age. Now, Inspector Faraday was played by Richard Lane, better known to people later on as Dick Lane. He would do some movie work, primarily a television performer for KTLA in Los Angeles, and he would broadcast wrestling and roller derby. And that roller derby fame would take him to a movie role. Yep, he played with Raquel Welch in Kansas City Bomber. But for 15 years, he did the roller games, starting in 1961. And uh, quite frankly, that was probably his biggest fame was the roller derby. All righty, Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues now tomorrow we're going to have Westerns and Science Fiction and Claudia uh, with episodes of Gunsmoke, Port Laramie, The Roy Rogers Show, Dimension X, and, of course, Claudia. Because who better to be Claudia than Claudia? All right, we'll be back with an episode of The Whistler. But first, these important messages. A wise farmer knows that he must get his livestock under cover to protect them from radioactive fallout. An attack may never come, but it's wise to prepare now. I want to tell you, I've seen more of your comments, and I appreciate y'all that enjoy my commentary about these shows and about the lives and times of the actors and all that, and I appreciate that. And we keep doing these shows primarily because you keep listening. And I've seen the numbers, and they're quite interesting. Uh, we range any well, we range upwards of uh, 400 listeners a day, and that's greatly appreciated. And if you like us, and you want us to continue. Uh, I always say support the advertisers, but if you also want to go to classicradio.stream, that's classicradio.stream, uh, and uh, either buy something from the page or buy me a coffee, that would be greatly appreciated. That's at classicradio.stream. Always appreciate it. I intend to try for the first time in five years to take a vacation. And yes, there'll be plenty of shows. The shows will be here every day. The beautiful part of this is that I can record the shows in advance and they automatically go out and there's never an issue. Isn't that wonderful? Technology is amazing. Now, an episode of The Whistler. Yes, I, yes, believe it or not, I am transcribed. An episode of The Whistler uh, from the West Coast of the U.S. 76 years ago, June 30th, 1948. The episode entitled Small Town Girl. I doubt if it has anything to do with Don't Stop Believing, but we'll see. And now for the radio program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program. The mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because you know who's guilty. You see his every move. You know his complete plans, even his innermost thoughts. Yet the final curtain always brings a startling surprise. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, 
I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's the Whistler for the tops in entertainment. And for the tops in gasoline quality, it's Signal. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly independent signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Small Town Girl. The young man was tall, tanned, and impressive. There wasn't a guest at Mrs. Parkford Smith's cocktail party who would deny that his presence had livened the affair considerably. The hostess especially appreciated Mr. Derek Marlowe, his gentle <laughs> flattery and his absurdly amusing story. Oh, Mr. Marlowe! <laughs> Derek, you know that isn't true. It couldn't have happened that way. Oh, but it did, Smitty. And the story was a rage on the continent. <laughs> Bob Leland was there. You remember, don't you, Bob? Yes, yes, Derek, I remember. You and Bob must have had some rare old times together during your student days. Oh, we did. We, uh, we did. We were always thinking of ways to uh, break loose, eh, hey, Bob? Yes, yes, we were. Now, Bob, in the interest of Anglo-American relations, you should have introduced us all to Derek a long time ago. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Oh, it's Park. all right, dear. We've made up for lost time. <laughs> you are going to have to speak to him, though, Bob? Speak to him? Yes. I resent the fact that he hasn't let any of us in on his new business venture. Now, now, we don't mix business and pleasure. Now, I believe you Americans invented that slogan. Oh, yes, but we don't live by it. It's really quite the opposite. That's right, Marlowe. <laughs> well, well, another time, perhaps. Besides, I, I think we have all the money we need uh, now. Derek. Yes? I'm going to have to run along. Could I see you a minute first? Oh, certainly. Now, don't you keep him long. Remember, you're going to tell us the story about the Dutch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We can go out on the terrace. You're being very mysterious, old boy. Okay, Derek, you can drop it. You're not the crown prince in front of me. This is where you get off. Oh, now, my dear boy, you can't mean that. But I do. I'm fed up, understand? Tired of having you use me as an entree to impose on my friends, to cheat them out of their money. Really, Bob? Can I help it if your friends enjoy my company? They wouldn't if they knew the truth about you. And, uh, do they know the truth about you, Bob? About that slight matter of your prison term during your four years of uh, study in England? Never mind. Oh, it's all right. I'm not complaining, you know. After all, if we hadn't been uh, cellmates at dear old Wandsworth... You don't frighten me anymore, Marlowe. I think I do. I've noticed that family reputations are just as important here in America as they are at home. Perhaps. But I'm warning you right now. Stop fattening Mrs. Smith for the kill. She's not putting a cent into any of your deals. On the contrary... I expect she'll insist on investing quite heavily. And if she doesn't, well, perhaps your father could be persuaded to put up a few thousand. My father. If you ever dared to go that far, I'd... And you'd what? We'd better understand each other right now, my dear ex me. I'll go as far as I like with anyone I choose to have you introduce me to. And there's nothing you can do about it. Not a thing. <laughs> No, Derek, you're not worried about Bob Leland's threats, not for an instant. The offense that sent him to Wandsworth Prison while he was a student in England was a minor one. Little more than a college prank that backfired. But it did land him in a British prison. And with the importance of his father's position, it gives you the key you need to open wide the doors of society. That's what brought you here to America, isn't it? And living in Bob Leland's home being accepted by his parents and introduced to his society friends makes it all so easy. A few more weeks of gaining their confidence and you'll be satisfied to leave Bob alone, to move on out of his life, a much wealthier man than when you arrived. You don't see any more of Bob that evening, and the next day you stroll down to the stables for your afternoon ride. Oh, Mr. Marlowe. Huh? Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> I bet you don't even remember me. Allison Kingsley. Uh, Alice? I knew it. I was um, one of the many people you met at Mrs. Parkford uh, uh, at Smitty's cocktail party yesterday. Uh, Bob introduced us. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, you're his fiancée. Oh, not yet. And I won't be if he doesn't stop standing me up this way. We had a date to go riding. Oh? 
Well, uh, as an acquaintance of long standing, I can tell you that the only way to handle that habit of his is with a slight kick in the shin. <laughs> and uh, how do you suggest I do that when he isn't here? Simple. You go riding with me. Oh, I see. I'll admit it's a temptation. But if he did show up... He'd learn that you were a lady with a mind of your own. All saddled up, Mr. Morrow. Right. Well, what do you say? I... All right, I'll do it. But, of course, only as a lesson to Bob. Whoa! Oh, whoa, my, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. Oh, oh, that was wonderful. You, uh, you ride very well. Thanks. We ought to walk in, though. Cool the horses down. Oh, suits me. You know, Alison, this, this is much better than a cocktail party. I mean, to, to really get to know someone. Oh? You think you know me now? Like a book. You were born in Kansas. You come to the big city with ambitions to become a famous actress. You're a model by profession, awaiting the day when you get the big break. Unless Bob Leland talks you into marriage before that happens. Now you're making fun of me. Not at all. I admire you. In fact, I, I wish I could see you again, Alice. Oh, here now, just how hard do you want me to kick Bob Shin? He might not like it if... Oh, Bob... Bob wouldn't mind. Not with me. He's a, I'm the best friend he has. I'm even staying at his home until I return to England. Yes, I know. How how about dinner, Alison? Perhaps uh, tomorrow evening? Well, I suppose I should convince Bob that I'm not just sitting around waiting for him. Supposing I call you, what? All right, Derek. Call me and we'll see. <laughs> I warn you, Derek, you'll go too far. Uh, really, old man, can I help it if Allison preferred to go riding with me? I was late. There was a rather important matter I wanted to look into. Then it's your own fault, putting business before Alice. No, it wasn't business. As a matter of fact, it concerned you, Derek. Oh? I got to thinking after our conversation last night. I decided to check on something, the little matter of your visa. What about my visa? I thought you'd been here a long time, too long. And I find out to my intense satisfaction that your stay in this country officially expires next week. Oh, yes? Yes. Well, don't weep any unnecessary tears for me. You see, I won't be leaving quite that soon. No? No. These official matters take time. The immigration authorities are frightfully busy these days. It'll probably be several weeks before they get around to their routine checkup. And by that time, uh, I'll have things quite well in hand. Oh, I see. Except that it might not take weeks if someone called your overstay to their attention. You haven't done that, have you? No. I wouldn't if I were you. And why not? Because if you do, Bob, I'll kill you. It... What did you say? I said I'll kill you. You see, I've been planning this little visit to America for a long time. Ever since our college days together at dear old Wandsworth. And I won't stand by and see my plan destroyed. You really mean that, don't you? Try me, and you'll find out. With the prologue of Small Town Girl, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But now a timely warning. Don't let your 4th of July weekend be spoiled by tire trouble. Or even worse, by the kind of an accident that faulty tires can cause. There's still time to replace those smooth, dangerous old tires with new Lee Super Deluxe tires at your signal service station. And when you choose Lee Super Deluxe tires, you're making one of today's best investments in safety and satisfaction. The broader, flatter riding surface of this completely new type tire has extra rubber in it for extra long mileage. And the 16 cleaning edges on the eight rib tread guarantee quicker stopping plus greater non-skid protection. In addition, you'll enjoy easier turning and steering and the way this new type tire absorbs road shocks. Yet you pay no more for a Lee Super Deluxe tire than for ordinary first line brands. And right now, signal dealers are offering special trade-in allowances plus liberal credit terms. So stop by your signal dealers tonight or tomorrow, sure. You'll be surprised how little it'll cost to start off on your 4th of July trip 
with new eight rib Lee Super Deluxe tires. And now back to the Whistler. makes it a stalemate, doesn't it, Derek? You'll use the fine art of threat with Bob Leland, and now he has a threat of his own. You wonder if he really would go to the immigration authorities, and it worries you, doesn't it? You need time to plant your deal with Mrs. Parkford Smith, time to nurture it and watch it grow. You realize you've got to get the upper hand again, to slow Bob down. And then you think of it. Allison. The girl Bob's in love with, the one person he wouldn't want to hurt, wouldn't want to learn about the sentence he served in that British prison. You decide that you can use Alison Kingsley to advantage, and so you press hard to arrange that dinner date, and then another and another, until you can sense that she's becoming quite fond of you, helping even more than you'd counted on. You know something, Derek? I know a lady who's positively captivated by you. Really, Alison? Really? That's a delightful coincidence. You see, I know a man uh, who... Oh, now, wait a minute. The lady I speak of, um, she's Mrs. Parkford Smith. Oh, I thought... No, you didn't. Uh, anyway, I had lunch with Smitty today. Oh, the old girl's really quite fond of you, isn't she? Oh, she's been wonderful. She's, uh, she's sponsor of the little theater group, you know. She's helped me more than I can say. But... That's not what I wanted to talk about. Oh, what then? Derek, why don't you talk to her? Send her the brochures. Let her in on that venture of yours. Whatever it is. You, uh, really think she'd like to invest something? I know it. She practically begged me to say something. And she has confidence in you, Derek. Just as I have. Allison, you're... You're a very fine person. If... If I thought for a moment there was a chance... Derek... Of... Don't no, spoil anything. No, no, I, I mean it. You'll, you'll be sailing off to England as soon as you've wound up your business here. I've known that all along. You'd never let yourself think seriously about a, about an American girl. But why not? Why not, Alison? We get along so beautifully. We... But it would tie you down, Derek. Perhaps keep you here in this country. Oh, keep me in this country, but why? Why, yes, yes, it, it might do that. Allison. Yes, Derek? There's a moon tonight. What do you say if we, if we get into the car and have a drive down by the sea? Do you really want to? Yes, I do want to. Very much. Well, here we are. Right back to your front door, safe and sound. <laughs> Had fun? Oh, it's been a perfect evening, Derek. I'll see you upstairs. Uh, no, I'm afraid we disturbed my roommate. She goes to bed quite early. Roommate? Why, I didn't know you, you shared your apartment with anyone. Oh, yes. Emma Shoup, a girl from my hometown. You've never looked at the mailbox. Emma Shoup, Alison Kingsley. Yes. We've shared an apartment ever since I arrived in New York. Well, uh, do you think your friend Miss Shoup would mind so much? You know, you've never once asked me in. I'm afraid she would. Emma's a small-town girl. She's wonderful, actually, but uh, she doesn't approve of some of my boyfriends, especially when they keep me out this late. Oh, I, I see. The ogre guarding the beautiful princess, is that it? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> well, perhaps I'll eventually get on her good side and charm her into submission. <laughs> perhaps. Well, anyway, it's pretty late tonight. <laughs> good night, Derek. And thanks again. Not at all. You know, Alison, I hope we can have many more evenings together. Derek, sometimes I don't know whether to believe you or not. I'd like to be sure, but... You can be. You can depend on me, Alison. I mean what I say. You are sincere now, aren't you, Derek? And when Alison mentioned that marriage might keep you in this country, she gave you an idea. Yes, it's the answer to your problem. A wedding might not ensure permanent residence in America, but at least there'd be a long delay. Enough time to feather your nest beautifully before returning to England. 
So the next morning you call Mrs. Parkford Smith, arrange to send her the brochures. And you're delighted when she offers to invest $75,000 with you. However, there'll be a short delay, a matter of a week or so before you can get the money. So there's nothing to do but wait. The days drag by slowly. And on the morning of the third day, as you're about to leave the house, you run into Bob downstairs. Morning, Derek. Going out again? Oh, Bob. Well, uh, how's the stranger? Where have you been keeping yourself these days? Well, I've been around here. It's been rather pleasant having the place to myself for a change. You've been quite busy, haven't you, Derek? Quite. Oh, by the way, there's a letter for you. There on the hall table. A letter? Oh. Oh, I wonder who could... It's... It's from the immigration office. Yes. The immigration office. Mr. Derek Marlowe, care of Mr. Robert Leland, 1822 Oakdale Road. Dear Mr. Marlowe, this is to inform you that as of midnight, July the 2nd, your passport and necessary documents covering entry into the United States will have expired and... You did this! You notified them. I didn't do anything at all, Derek. I'm sure they have routine ways of checking you such... You want me out of this country. Really? How can you say that, old chap? And not just because of your friends. That isn't all you're afraid of, is it, Bob? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. If you don't, you're the only one who hasn't noticed. All right, Bob. You asked for this. I haven't asked for anything, and I didn't set up the immigration laws. You have to get out legally. Could I have caused that? Perhaps. Perhaps not. But you think you won, don't you? Because this letter gives me only a few days more. Well, we'll see about that, Bob. Perhaps I have a surprise for you. A big surprise. There's still a chance, Derek, to stay with your scheme. To get your hands on Mrs. Parkford Smith's $75,000. Only you'll have to propose to Allison a little sooner. You hope Allison won't think you're rushing things as you hurry to her apartment, anxious to have everything settled before the immigration authorities pay a call. Yes? Oh, Derek. I, I had to see you, Allison. I, I couldn't stay away. May, may I come in? But, Derek... I know, Emma Shoup, but you just have to let me explain. I, I must talk to you, Emma or no Emma. I'm afraid you won't be bothered with Emma anymore, Derek. What? You don't mean that she's leaving? Yes. Emma's leaving. Just like that? Just like that. You, uh, quarreled, did you? Yes. You can call it a quarrel. May I come in? If you wish. So, dear old Emma's moving out. Going back to the small town, is she? Yes. She's going back where she belongs. She's packed and ready to take the train for home. In another 15 minutes, she'll be pulling out of Pennsylvania Station. Well, I can't say I'm sorry. No. I don't suppose you would be, Derek. Look here, darling. I didn't come here to discuss Emma Shoup. Allison, the reason I had to see you rushed over here like this, I... I well, it's something I've got to ask you. Right away. Oh? Allison, the other night... What you said about my staying in this country. Well, I, I, I've decided I like it here. I like it very much. I see. Do you know why? I haven't the faintest idea. Allison, darling, you're not making this any easier for me, but I love you. I want you to be my wife. I want you to marry me. I... <laughs> marry you? <laughs> why are you laughing? You don't love me. You never have. You've been using me to, to get to Smitty, to, to strike at Bob in some way. I don't know what it is, but Bob's in some sort of trouble, isn't he? And you know about it. No, 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 that isn't it, Alice. I... Don't tell me you're his best friend, or anyone. Alice! You see, Derek, Mrs. Smith wasn't quite as gullible as you assumed. Those brochures you sent her, the entire proposition, she had her attorneys check it thoroughly. They also checked on you. She called me about it. So... What are you going to do? I've already done it. You'll have a visitor any day now, Mr. Derek Marlowe. From the immigration office. I've told them all about you. You? You told them? The moment I found out, yes. You. You made a fool of me. And 
absolute fool. What's the matter, Derek? Can't you take a bit of your own... Derek. Derek, what are you going to do? You made a fool out of me. It happened swiftly, Derek. A few wild, unreasoning moments, and then you're standing over her, trembling, terrified at the realization that you've killed her. And just as suddenly, you know that you've got to find a way out. This is far more than attempted fraud, isn't it, Derek? It can mean your life. And then as you stand there, forcing yourself to think, something comes back to you. Your conversation with Allison when you first arrived at the apartment. Emma's leaving. You, uh, quarreled, did you? Yes, you can call it a quarrel. She's going back home. In another 15 minutes, she'll be pulling out of Pennsylvania Station. Yes, Derek. Whether there actually was a quarrel or not, it's your only out. And you're certain that you can make it seem that way. You slip out of the apartment quietly, leave the building without being seen. 20 minutes later, you're back and on your way to Allison's apartment with the house manager. Terribly sorry to bother you like this, Mrs. Fremont, but when Miss Kingsley didn't answer my ring... You say you heard someone in there with her a while ago. Uh, yes, they, they, they seem to be quarreling. Oh, any idea who it was? Well, I, I, I'd rather not say. Well, we'd better talk to her. Hmm. Perhaps I'd better wait for you. All right. She might be laying down. I'll just... <gasps> Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Marlowe. Yes? What is it? Oh. Oh. Good Lord. She's dead. The poor thing's dead. Somebody's killed uh, her. Don't, don't get excited, Mrs. Fremont. Oh. Don't touch anything. We've got to call the police right away. The police, yes. And when they get here, I may be able to help. I, I'm quite sure I know who did this. Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, since next Monday, July 4th, you'll be celebrating the 172nd birthday of independence for America. It's interesting to note that since the war, there has been a tremendous rebirth of that independent spirit as more and more veterans go into business for themselves. That's particularly gratifying to us at Signal because since the very beginning, Signal products have been sold only through independent dealers. At first, there were just a handful of them in Southern California. But drivers liked Signal products and services so well that the Signal family grew and grew, until today there are almost 2,000 Signal stations serving six western states from Canada to Mexico. Now, obviously, there must be good reasons why so many drivers have switched to Signal. To discover them for yourself, stop by your nearby Signal station before the 4th of July weekend and fill up with Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. You'll like it. And at independent Signal stations, you'll see a fine example of the American way of doing business that has made and kept our land such a great place in which to live and make a living. And now back to the Whistler. It's working perfectly so far, isn't it, Derek? The police had very little to ask in the preliminary investigation. And at headquarters, waiting outside Lieutenant Anderson's office, you have plenty of time to go over and over the story in your mind. Exactly what you must tell them. Yes, Derek, you have all the answers. And you had no trouble giving them convincingly when the routine questioning began. And, well, that's all there is to it, Lieutenant. You can understand how shocked I was when Mrs. Fremont called me in and I, I saw poor Alice. Yeah, sure, we know about that. Now, let's see if I've got this straight. You went to the apartment the first time and heard her arguing with a roommate. Could you tell what the argument was about? Well, yes, that, that's why I didn't ring. I didn't want to embarrass Allison. They were quarreling over... Uh, over me. <clears throat> oh, I see. Allison and I were going to be married. Her roommate, Emma Shoup felt that she wasn't being fair to Bob Leland. Leland, eh? Sergeant, you might as well bring him in here now. Yes, sir. Leland, in here. Lieutenant, I... Oh. 
Oh, so they finally caught up with you, did they, Derek? I'm afraid that's a bit of wishful thinking, Leland. And out of place, as usual. Never well, mind you two. Save it. Sit down. If you don't mind, Lieutenant, I hate to sit here chatting with... with him. After all, the girl I was in love with has been murdered. And you're not doing anything... Ab- oh, yes, we are, Marlowe. The railroads will be checked, the airports and bus stations. We'll get this Emma Shoop in plenty of time. Uh, Emma Shoop? Wait a minute. What about Emma Shoop? Just before Miss Kingsley was murdered, Marlowe here went to her apartment. Heard the two of them arguing. Arguing? Allison and... And Emma Shoup. Oh, oh, no. Oh, yes. Sorry to disappoint you, old man, but what they had to say to each other was pretty violent. You, uh, you told the lieutenant that. It happens to be the truth, Leland. <laughs> is it, Derek? And this is one time when you've stretched the truth too far. There wasn't any argument, lieutenant. There couldn't have been. No? Then why not? Well, I guess it was the sort of thing only a small-town girl would do. But when Emma Shoup first came out here from Kansas, she stumbled on a simple trick to protect herself from phonies like you, Derek. She put two names on her mailbox. Her real name, Emma Shoup, and the name she hoped to make famous. Allison Kingsley. That's right, Lieutenant. Emma Shoup and Allison Kingsley were two names for the same girl. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Wednesday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Paul Cavanaugh and Lorette Philbrandt. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Leslie Edgeley and music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember next Wednesday at the same time another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS where 99 million people gather every week the Columbia Broadcasting System. From 76 years ago today, June 30th, 1948, The Whistler here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Signal Oil, uh, established in the 1920s, it became part of the larger Signal Conglomerations, a company's conglomeration, which merged with Gannett Corporation, uh, leading to a diversification of its business interests. Eventually, it became a part of Allied Signal, which later merged with Honeywell in 1999. So Signal Oil is still around today, a part of Honeywell, which also Honeywell assets, uh, those actually contain a portion of another radio sponsor of note, Autolite. So now you know the rest of that story. I'm Wyatt Cox. More than old radio shows, it's classic radio theater. And uh, we do all these historical things as well. Coming up next, Monty Woolley in The Magnificent Montague. Every family should have a home shelter area. Every family should stock that shelter area with a two-week supply of food and water. Prepare now to survive disaster. Classic Radio Theater, I'm Wyatt Cox. Thank you so much for making us a part of your Sunday, the last Sunday in the month of June, and uh, Independence Day is right around the corner. Let me real quick run through uh, some of the shows coming up in the next few days. We mentioned tomorrow, Gunsmoke, Fort Laramie, 
Roy Rogers, Dimension X. We'll also have coming up, Let George Do It, I Was a Communist with the FBI, Nightwatch, the predecessor to Cops, also Gangbusters. We'll also have Alum and Abner. We'll have some Superman. We'll have Have Gun, Will Travel, Our Miss Brooks. Uh, Too Many Cooks, a summer series. Also, Life with Luigi for uh, for Independence Day. We'll have Life with Luigi, the Penny Singleton Show. We'll also have a Norman Corwin Home for the Fourth. And we'll also have an episode of NBC, WNBC Radio's Anthology, their Fourth of July special. That's all coming up in the next few days here on Classic Radio Theater. But right now, we are going to head for some comedy with uh, Magnificent Monty U starring Monty Woolley. Interestingly enough, uh, probably the one real uh, opportunity I've had to uh, uh, hear Woolley's work was not even, was this show. Uh, The one episode of The Man Who Came to Dinner, which is what Monty Woolley uh, performed in in Broadway and probably his best-known work, uh, it was actually done on a hot point holiday, uh, hot point. What was it? Hot point holiday special. And in that point, the role that Monty Woolley played was instead played by Jack Benny. So uh, hopefully, I can find a copy of that and see if uh, uh, if the not the hot point holiday special, but the uh, uh, the man who came to dinner, and see if I can find one of those to bring you here on this so you can actually hear Monty Woolley in his true element. Anyway, the magnificent Montague, who, uh, in in case you don't know the premise of the show or haven't figured it out by listening to it, uh, a Shakespearean, classically trained actor reduced to playing (laughs) a role on, uh, uh, on radio as Uncle Goodhart. So we'll hear that. Uh, 73 years ago, June 30th, 1951, a one-season series here as uh, he deals with July 4th. The Magnificent Montague, starring Monty Woolley. Yes, it's the Magnificent Montague, the Saturday night transcribed feature on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by Chesterfield. Always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. By Addison, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, and first in television. Before we hear from the Magnificent Montague, let's hear from Chesterfield. You see it in the newspapers. No unpleasant aftertaste. You hear it on the radio. No unpleasant aftertaste. You see it on television. No unpleasant aftertaste when you smoke Chesterfield. It's the biggest plus in cigarette history. Science discovered it. You can prove it. Science discovered that of all brands tested, Chesterfield, and only Chesterfield, leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. Prove it yourself. Smoke a pack of Chesterfields. They're always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. And Chesterfield is the cigarette that leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That's the biggest plus in cigarette history. No unpleasant aftertaste. Science discovered it. Prove it yourself. Buy Chesterfields today. And now, the magnificent Montague. Although Edwin, the magnificent Montague, left the stage to become Uncle Goodhart, hero of an afternoon radio program, he has remained a member and the moving force of the Proscenium Club, that stalwart organization of Shakespearean actors who live in an unemployed world of their own. All year long, the Proscenium Club waits for their one big event, their annual Fourth of July picnic and outing at Shakespeare Grove. It is the morning of the great event. In the Montague apartment, his wife Lily and Agnes the maid are making up lunch baskets. Agnes is very happy. Have you got the mustard, mustard, mustard? Have you got the pickles, pickles, pickles? Have you got the relish, relish, relish? Have you got the... Agnes! 
Yeah, honey? Oh, you have the lunch basket almost packed. What a picnic. Look at this food. Fried chicken, potato salad, deviled eggs, chocolate cake. Boy, are those ants going to live. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everything looks so... Oh, wait, Agnes. What, honey? I just remembered. Edwin hates deviled eggs. So what? Well, it'll spoil the picnic for him. What picnic? Well, Agnes, isn't that lunch for the Proscenium Club 4th of July picnic? Are you kidding? This is for my picnic. Your picnic? Yeah, my social club. The unattached girls of East 37th Street's throwing one. <laughs> oh, dear. I thought that lunch was for Edwin. I don't worry. I'll fix him one right now. Oh, good. Have I got the poison, poison, poison? Have I got the arsenic, arsenic, arsenic? Agnes. Why don't you come along with us? Honey, please don't trap me into one of those outdoor memorial services the Proscenium Club calls a picnic. But, Agnes, it's always great fun. That picnic with Edwin's old actor friend. Fun? With those stuffy old actors? Oh, Agnes, you know on the picnic they're very informal. Oh, they're a real fun-loving bunch of madcaps. <laughs> Sitting around under the trees with their spats unbuttoned. <laughs> Agnes, you, you know there's always swimming. Now, that's worth saying. The swimming suits those old fogies climb into. <laughs> they may be a little conservative and old-fashioned. Whatever it is, it's the only place you can still see a double-breasted bathing suit with a belt in the back. <laughs> oh, come now, Agnes. The campfire with those long, dull recitations from Shakespeare. And then your husband takes over with his annual rendering of Hamlet's soliloquy. I can still hear the voice ringing through the woods. Mm, it really gets them. It must. Last year, 200 moose came running looking for me. <laughs> oh, Agnes, it won't be the same without you. No, honey, I'm all set to go with the unattached girls of East 37th Street. The entertainment committee's lined up a boat ride up to Bear Mountain. The invitation says campfire, songs, and dancing. Dancing at Bear Mountain? Oh, then you all have dates. Dates? Those girls? You kidding? Well, who are you going to dance with? The bears, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Agnes. Wait till the bears get a load of my club. There'll be an early hibernation this year. <laughs> oh, come along to the Proscenium Club picnic with us, Agnes. Edward will be... Uh-oh, I hear him. He's now out. comes the warming of the magnificent Montague's tonsils. Yeah. Air raid, air raid, go to your shelter. <laughs> Please. Uh, Emma, good morning, Lily. Good morning, Edwin. Gad, you look lovely this morning, Lily. Good morning, Mr. Montague. Gad. <laughs> Oh, now, Edwin, Agnes is very attractive this morning. Attractive? Lily, must she always wear those curlers in her hair when she's trying to attract lightning? <laughs> Look who's talking about beauty, the face with the hanging gardens. <laughs> oh, please stop. Now, both of you. It's so nice to have a man around the house, and we're stuck with a monster. Ah, <laughs> uh, Independence Day. This is the beginning of the fourth. Must we have a maid who talks as if she'd just finished a fifth? Agnes, don't answer him. Bring in Edwin's breakfast. Ah, breakfast. My morning tussle with Tomaine. Oh, stop picking on her. You have a big day in front of you. Right after your radio broadcast this afternoon, we're going to the Proscenium Club annual picnic. Yes, Lily. Tonight... Around the campfire, with all my faithful friends of the stage around me, I can forget for a moment that I, the magnificent Montague, deserted the theater for radio. From Hamlet to Uncle Goodhart is five times a week. I were a rogue and peasant slave am I. My offenses rank, oh, guilty conscience. Villainy, I am thy chief. What do you want with your eggs, Ham? <laughs> I mean, what do you want with your egg? Ham? <laughs> well, do me something over the slip of the tongue. Agnes, if that tongue of yours ever slipped, it would have hit the ground. <laughs> Edwin, don't feel so guilty about going into radio. Tonight, when you give your annual reading of Hamlet's soliloquy, you'll again be the magnificent Montague. Mm. Uh, don't you think you'd better rehearse it? I rehearse Hamlet's soliloquy. Oh, well, shame on you, Lily. I know it as I know the back of my own hand. To be or not to be, that is the problem. That is the question. That is the question. <laughs> Whether it is safe or in the mind to... Nobler in the mind. 
And no blood in the mind to suffer the arrows and slings. Slings and arrows. Slings and arrows of courageous fortune. Outrageous fortune. Outrageous fortune. Or to take arms against a pack of trouble. A sea of trouble. Uh, a sea of trouble. A mess of trouble. A mess of trouble. <laughs> Fun. Quiet. <laughs> to die, to sleep. To sleep, perchance to wake. Perchance to dream. Uh, perchance to dream. Perchance to snore. Perchance to... <laughs> the leg around here. Quiet, Agnes. Go on. To die, to sleep. To sleep, perchance to dream. Hey, there's the rub. Oh, bravo, Edward. <laughs> and you thought I didn't remember it. <laughs> Mr. Montego, you sure know it like the back of your own hand. Thank you. You must have been wearing gloves for 50 years. <laughs> Excuse me, Agnes, for exposing your delicate brain to culture. Hereafter, with you in the room, we will only quote from the racing form. <laughs> oh, never mind, Agnes Edwin. You sounded wonderful. They'll cheer you at the campfire tonight. Now, I've got to get things ready for the picnic. Wait, Lily. What is it, Edwin? Lily, I'm not going. Edwin! Well, you haven't missed a proscenium club 4th of July picnic in your whole life. I know, but Lily, this year I can't face it. Edward. Lily, the club never found out. I've deserted their ranks for the gold of radio. I'm not going. It's a mockery. Oh, Edwin, the proscenium picnic is more than just a group of Shakespearean actors having an outing. I know. It's the 4th of July. It's more than just the date of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It's where we first met. And the day it was signed. <laughs> Quiet, Lily. Now I remember we did meet at a Proscenium Club picnic. I was in the Gary Gaieties at the time and came to the picnic with one of the fellows from the show. And I was playing King Lear. Now, what girl did I bring? Betsy Ross. <laughs> Please. Remember we sat next to each other at the campfire, singing the big song of that year. Now, what was it? Marching through Georgia. <laughs> Agnes, just for that, no kennel ration for you tonight. <laughs> oh, what a picnic that was. You were after me all day. How you flirted. <laughs> How you ran from me. Oh, you acted so coy. You played so hard to get. You were so hard to take. <laughs> Please, Agnes, these are our memories. Oh, Edwin, we must go to that picnic. Lily... We'll find that same tree we carved our initials in. That little brook you carried me across. It's still all there, Lily. The same tree, the same brook, same moon, the same two people, you and I. Hello, young lovers, whoever you are. Hello, young lovers. Oh, quiet. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you recapture that mad moment. <laughs> oh, yes, we were mad. Mad? You must have been nuts. <laughs> Lily, when we see the little tree again where we carved our initials, something new is going to be hanging from it. Agnes. <laughs> then you're going to the picnic, Edwin? Am I promised a kiss in the moonlight from a certain beautiful lady? <laughs> if a certain handsome and dashing gentleman is there to carry a certain lady across the brook again, how can I refuse? <laughs> I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be sick. So help me, Lily, I'm going to kill her. You're going to be late for your broadcast, and we all have to get ready for the picnic. I'll pick you and Agnes up right after my broadcast. Oh, Edwin, Agnes can't go on the picnic with us. She can? No, she's going up the river with her friends. I knew it. The Kapalma <laughs> Committee is back. <laughs> Oh, no, Edwin. Agnes has an outing of her own to go to. For the first time, she won't be with us. Shakespeare Grove and no Agnes. This is really going to be a picnic. Goodbye! We'll be back with the magnificent Montague in just a moment. If you suffer from pains of headaches, neuritis, and neuralgia, you should discover what many thousands have known for years, that Anison brings incredibly fast, effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. 
That is, Allison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Probably at some time you have received an envelope containing Allison tablets from your physician or dentist. Thousands of people have been introduced to Allison this way. Try Allison yourself the next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted at how quickly relief can come. Allison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Your druggist has Allison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100 for your medicine cabinet. Ask for Allison today. And now, back to the magnificent Montague. With thoughts of the picnic on his mind, he is just finishing his Uncle Goodhart radio program. Listen. Come, come, Ronald. All fun-loving boys celebrate the 4th of July. Some shoot firecrackers. Some light the skyrockets. You, Ronald, like to blow open banks, say. <laughs> Dear listeners, this is just an example of the trouble you can get into on 4th of July. That is why your Uncle Goodhart has been urging you to spend the 4th of July at home, safe from accidents, and you will live once again to greet the new day with your eyes high into the sun and light. So ends another episode of Uncle Goodhart. And now, stand by as we announce the lucky winners of the Uncle Goodhart Letter Writing Contest. The prize-winning letter on the subject, How I Would Spend the Fourth of July at Home with Uncle Goodhart, was written in by Mr. and Mrs. Stonewall Putu of Hemlock Hill, Tennessee. Mr. and Mrs. Putu are on their way to New York, all expenses paid to fulfill their heart's desire. They will spend the Fourth of July in the happy home of Uncle Goodhart. <laughs> Off the air, Mr. Montague. Good show. No, oh, that was a beaut. How do I keep out of jail? Ask our director, Mr. Zinza. Had a lot of heart to it, didn't it, Zinza? Oh, yes, three. That was the real doother. <laughs> oh, shut up, Zinza. Yes, sir. Springer, what is he mumbling about? I distinctly heard the announcers say something about someone winning a contest about the 4th of July. Oh, you mean the how I would spend my 4th of July in Uncle Goodhart's home. How I would spend my what with whom? Zinza, didn't you explain? You tell him. Zinza! Oh, dear. Well, you see, Mr. Montague, the people who won the contest get to spend 4th of July in your house. Don't hit me. Zinza, my home is not a one-night stand for drooling idiots dragged in from the hinterlands by flugel soap. Yeah, but Mr. Montague, Mr. and Mrs. Patu won the contest in good faith. It was a national contest. The federal government have laws guaranteeing the prize. Good. Let the government be their host. Let them stay at Blair House. <laughs> Mr. Montague, this will mean trouble for you. Gentlemen, and I use the word loosely, <laughs> I'm going out on a picnic today. Mr. Montague, you can't go out. You've been campaigning for people to stay home on the 4th. We announced the winner would spend the 4th of July with you and get everything they mentioned in the letter. Get everything they mentioned? Where's the letter? Read it. Go on, Zinza. It says, round about sundown, Ma and I would climb into our Sunday go to meet and clothes and show up at dear Uncle Goodhart's diggings. Yeah. Ma would give Uncle Goodhart's wife her own recipe for Southern Dixie goulash, which dear Aunt Goodhart would start cooking for dinner. Yeah. Then we would all sit around the fireplace, singing, gossiping, and playing the melodeon, and just to sitting and listening to Uncle Goodhart's homey philosophy. Yeah. Signed, Mr. and Mrs. Stonewall Patu. That's all, Mr. Montague. It is? Yes. Oh, no. You think I'm turning my apartment into a sharecropper's villa? Mr. Montague, you have a contract. But I must go to my picnic. Mr. Montague, they're coming in by bus. After two days and nights riding, they'll be dead tired. Yeah, they'll probably fall asleep. Sleep. That's it. Now, Zinza, when you get them off that bus, 
I want you to take them sightseeing. Sightseeing in this heat? They won't make it. Fine. <laughs> when you arrive at my apartment with them at six o'clock, and when I open the door, I want them to fall in. <laughs> Out cold. There was any other way. Oh, this is a fine time to tell me to cancel my picnic. I got a right to live, too. Agnes, I told you we were expecting Mr. and Mrs. Patu. Well, I think it's shameful getting those people tired just so we can walk out on them. And what did you want me to do? Sit around all night with them hog calling? <laughs> well, Edmund, it may kill them. Oh, that's Zinza and the Patus. Come in. Zinza! Water, water. Grab him. Don't let him fall. Agnes, a glass of water. Zinza, are you all right? I'm dehydrated. <laughs> walking, walking in that sun. Oh, uh, easy, old man. There you are. Uh, where are the Patoos? Right here. Mr. and Mrs. Patu, this is Uncle Goodhart. Howdy. It's Uncle Goodhart. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? That's the rebel yell, Mr. Montague. He does it every ten minutes. My eardrums went on the third one. Oh, Zinza, you're shot. You'd better go. Uncle Goodhart, begging your pardon, sir, but it gives me great pride to present the little lady who I'm proud, mighty proud to say is my wife, Emmy May. Well, Lance, thanks a lot, my dear. If last week anyone was to tell me I'd be here in little old New York and meet y'all, I would have said, you're just plum for just a week, and you better watch out. All right, right Emmy. <laughs> She's a little loose in the lips. <laughs> well, where do we start, Uncle? I guess you're kind of tired. If you'd like to lie down, the beds are all... I didn't able it, Uncle Goodhart. But if you don't mind, I'll just stand. Stand? Been riding on a bus two days and three nights. I'm kind of saddle sore. <laughs> if you get what I mean. <laughs> oh, no. Come up to him on the bus, and this stranger says him all cut and sassy. He hits his head simple. All right, Emmy. She does take off. Did the Patoos arrive? Why, Uncle Goodhart, don't tell me this pretty little heifer sidling up to us is your wife, Andy Goodhart. Uh, yes, the pretty little heifer is my wife. The name is Mr. Mrs. Patoo. Welcome to New York, and welcome to our home. Uh, I do declare, I thought when we left that little old Mason Dixon live, we left hospitality behind us. And here y'all talk like you've known us all night. All right, Emmy. <laughs> well, what are you women folks standing around for? Get in the kitchen. Well, I got the beds all right, Oaks. They're here, huh? Uh, this is Agnes. Well, well. And am I having the honor of meeting the fair daughter of your family? <laughs> Mighty beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful, my dear Mr. Patu. I do declare you are stretching southern chivalry to the breaking point. <laughs> this is Agnes, our maid. Your maid? Got one of those, huh? <coughs> Your Abe Lincoln took ours away. <laughs> Uncle. Well, right now I'm thinking of personally firing on Fort Sumter and starting the whole war over again. <laughs> well, what are you women folks standing around here gassing for? I'm hungry. My stomach's hollering. Send it down, boy. Send it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a dinner is... You all are going to eat on the patoos tonight, just like I said in our letter. MMA, fetch me the suitcase. Suitcase? Yes, sir. Uh, we brung our own vittles. Hey, uh, Mrs. Goodhart, in this suitcase, we got all the makers for MMA's Dixie Goulash. It's chock full of hog jowls, turnip greens, hominy grits, fat back chitlins, black eyed peas, and for flavoring, a couple of squirrel heads. <laughs> Careful when you open it up, honey. Been riding on top of the bus for two days. Might be a little high. <laughs> What's the matter, Uncle? You look a little green. Oh. I'll be all right. Can't wait to wrap your gums around it, hey? <laughs> Tell his missus how to make it, Emmy May. Let's go, Agnes. Okay, you don't mind if I eat the suitcase. <laughs> Get, Agnes. Now, let's sit down by the fireplace, like we said in the letter, and sing some of them oldies but goodies. Well, I'm afraid I... Uh... Yeah. 
the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia on the trail of the Lone Star Fire. Now that was a meal. How about it, Mrs. Goodhart? There's still one squirrel head left. <laughs> no, thank you. Why, honey, you didn't taste enough to keep a bowl weevil crawling. Hey, whatever did happen to Uncle Goodhart? He swallowed one mouthful and took off like a hound dog dipped in turpentine. <laughs> Don't explain it to him, Emmy. Uh, he'll be out in a minute. Uh, Agnes, will you clear the table? Clear it? I wouldn't touch it. Ah, here's Uncle. Uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. I'm, I'm still a little shaky. Uh, Lily, would you would you step step out here? Well, what is it, Edmund? Uh, Lily, we've got to get them to sleep. Edmund, after that meal they put down, they can only stay awake another few minutes. Lily, we've got to put them to sleep. Well, do your Hamlet soliloquy. That hasn't missed yet. Shh. <laughs> Look, I saw him yawn. I'll go back. <laughs> yeah. Mighty tired after that meal. Oh, now, here, take this easy chair. Just sink into it. Yeah. Usually after dinner, Stonewall usually just sits around sucking on his teeth with his belt off and his stomach just a growl and a growl and a growl. Oh, right. <laughs> hey, how about another song? Camp Town brings back six miles on our way. Wait, 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 wait you just relax. Let me read you my philosophy, like you said in your letter. Ever hear of a writer called Shakespeare? Shakespeare? Can't say that I have. But Emmy May, yeah, she was a high school teacher in Hemlock Hills. Emmy May, you ever hear of Shakespeare? No, but I declare we used to do a heap of reading out of the Sears robot cat. All right, Emmy. <laughs> Agnes, will you play the melodeon in the studio set up? Just like we're asked for in the letter. Uh, go ahead, Agnes. Stand by with the pillows, Lily. Mighty pretty. Isn't it, Emmy May? So, well, I do declare I'm just... All right, Emmy May. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Relax, my dear Mr. and Mrs. Patu. Let me read you Hamlet's soliloquy. Watch that, Uncle. There are women in the room. <laughs> no, relax, relax. <laughs> listen, listen. To be or not to be, that is the question. Pretty. Mighty pretty. Well, it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous horsemen. To sleep. To sleep. A chance to dream. They're asleep. Already? Congratulations, that's a new record. Let's go. No, no, let's make sure they're asleep. Mr. Patu. <laughs> Mrs. Patu. <laughs> that's it, Lily, the lunch baskets. On to the picnic. Here, Edwin, let's go. Hurry, Agnes. Coming. Emmy May? Yeah. Is the old goat and his wife gone? Yeah. I thought we'd be hung up with them forever. Oh, so are you. Yeah, gosh. And now let's celebrate the fourth as it should be celebrated. Mrs. Patu, if you'll take my arm, we'll go out and get low dead. It's a glorious fourth of July. Here's a word from RCA Victor. It will pay you to remember this name, the RCA Victor Regency. Yes, remember the Regency. Remember the Regency when you buy television. If it's value you want, remember the Regency. If it's performance you want, remember the Regency. And if it's quality you want, remember the Regency. Here is the world's finest television, RCA Victor 17-inch million-proof television, quality proven in over 2 million homes. Television with the clearest, brightest, steadiest pictures ever. And the Regency is more than a television set. 
Its superb console cabinet is a fine furniture piece, too. A magnificent example of RCA Victor craftsmanship that you'll be proud to have in your home. The Regency is available now at your RCA Victor dealers. Ask for it by name. Yes, remember the Regency. The console television that brings you more for your money. Write that name down now. The RCA Victor Regency. Listen again next week, friends, to the magnificent Montague starring Monty Woolley. The Saturday night transcribed feature on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by Allison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, and first in television. The Magnificent Montague was written by Nat Hyken and Billy Friedberg. Ann Seymour was Lily. Pert Kelton was Agnes. Also heard tonight were Art Carney, Johnny Gibson, John Griggs, and Ann Petoniak. Jack Ward was at the organ. This is Don Pardo speaking. Did a little digging while that was running and found out there were a few adaptations. The earliest was in 1939, prior to the 1942 motion picture. Was it 42, the motion picture? I believe it was. Uh, And this one was produced and directed by Orson Welles, who also starred in the Campbell's Playhouse. Now, a 1942 adaptation... Uh, with uh, Monty Woolley in the uh, in their roles in that, and also in the Lux Radio Theater, which starred Clifton Webb as Sheridan Whiteside. So there is one out there that we can find. There may be other adaptations. I did not know that Wells also starred in a 1972 film adaptation of the play, uh, and that was 1972. And uh, that one I didn't know about. It ran 73 minutes, so it was obviously one of those made-for-TV movies. Uh, From uh, June 30th, 1951, The Magnificent Montague here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Okay, Jimmy, she's coming. Your girlfriend, uh, the the person whom you wish to have uh, an especial accoutrement with. That made no sense, I know. Marie Wilson, my friend Irma, as Irma buys an air conditioner. Well, why would we... Well, I guess I know why we'd need an air conditioner for Irma, because she's too hot. Should public utilities fail in time of disaster, refrigerated foods must be either cooked or eaten before they spoil. If this can't be done... Classic Radio Theater continues now with an episode of My Friend Irma starring Marie Wilson. This is an Armed Forces recording, so the uh, ends commercials are not in it. Uh, This is from 71 years ago, June 30th, 1953, as Irma. Well, she, she buys an air conditioner. And while her heart was in the right place, their uh, vacation budget was not. My Friend Irma. Created by Cy Howard, transcribed from Hollywood, and starring Marie Wilson as Irma and Kathy Lewis as Jane. Well, nature is strange. This is the time of the year when the days begin getting shorter and I live with Irma Peterson, a girl whose head seems to be getting pointier. Yes, it's the end of June and in a couple of days we'll be going on our two-week vacation. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Irma, have you looked through all the travel folders? Yes, and I think I found a wonderful spot for two weeks. Where? What's it called? Uh, West Point. West Point. (laughs) West Point is a military academy for men. I told you it's a wonderful place. Uh (laughs) Hand me the map, will you, honey? Let me see. Hey, how about the Thousand Islands? 
Oh, I don't think I'd like that, Jane. Why not? Well, I might meet a nice fellow up there, and he might say, meet me on the island tonight, and I might go crazy trying to remember which one. <laughs> Honey, it's such a lovely spot, and we can do it on our budget. Budget? Yeah, y- you know, the $300 we saved in our joint checking account just for our vacation. Jane? What is it, Irma? I just remembered something. The look in your eyes tells me to sit down. What did you remember, Dal? Well, the other day... I'll get it. Does Ima Peterson live here? Yes. (laughs) Okay, fellas, uh, bring it in. Irma, what is this? It's that little thing I just remembered. Little? Looks like you're smuggling Fort Knox in here. <laughs> oh, it didn't cost that much. You bought this? Uh, why do you want it hooked up, lady? Just, minute, just wait, wait, wait. What is this thing, Irma? An air conditioner. An air conditioner? <laughs> yes. There was a big sale, and I thought it'd be nice if we could take the air outside and bring it in here and condition it. <laughs> have here in the summer shouldn't be conditioned. It should be deported. <laughs> Gentlemen, you may take this thing right back. Can't do it, lady. This was a closeout. All sales final. We got it hooked up right here in the living now, room, Now, wait lady. a minute, please. Will you Wait, listen. Uh... Lady, we got loads of these to deliver. Goodbye. Jane, don't look at me like that. You're my best friend, and if a stranger walked in, they'd swear you were my worst enemy. <laughs> Irma Peterson, where did you get the money for this? Out of our joint checking account, it was only $300. That's all we had in the account. I know I didn't want to overdraw. (laughs) Jane, don't pull your hair. We can't afford a beauty powder now. Oh, this is just great. Every summer when I'm on my vacation, I send a card to my father. Now I'll have to write him saying, I'm not doing anything, but my lungs are having a wonderful time. (laughs) Now, Jane, you're always looking at the worst side of things. Wait until I turn it on. There. And if you want an ocean breeze, a man said to just wave a herring in front of it. <laughs> Jane, why don't you say something? Isn't it nice and cool? Cool. Ooh. I'll have to get a mink stole to live with this thing. Well, that's why I got it so cheap. The medium adjustment is broken. <laughs> Wait a minute. Now it's getting warm in here. Yes, the man said there was something wrong with the temperature control, but if we dress accordingly, we will enjoy it. Yeah, well, now I'll have to get a wardrobe, mistress. Who is it? Uh, if you don't mind, it's me, Maestro Wanderkin. Well, put on a piff helmet and come in. <laughs> hello, hello, girls. Uh, uh, do you mind if I take off my jacket? No, but uh, have a blanket handy. Things are happening here. <laughs> What do you mean? Irma spent all our vacation money on this broken-down air conditioner. But, Irma, how could you buy an air conditioner? You know Mrs. O'Reilly's rules for the building. No pets allowed and no fresh air tolerated. (laughs) I scraped all year. I saved every nickel I could. Every time Irma got lost, I walked to the police station to bring her back so I wouldn't waste money for bus fare. And this is my reward? Hot and cold, running chills? Well, you mean you won't be able to go away, Jane? I don't see how, Meister. Of course, we each have two weeks' salary coming, which is $250, roughly. Well, that'll be enough for the next payment on the air conditioner. What? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have enough for the full price, 550 so they gave me friendly credit terms, and they were real friendly. When I left, they kissed me. <laughs> well, I, I better turn that thing off now It's getting cold No, leave it on I want to get double pneumonia Anything that'll put me out of my misery Please let me turn it off No, then we won't get the full pleasure out of it Oh, so help me I'm going to do something to that girl No, no, please, please, girls Don't let this become an issue between you We all make mistakes <laughs> But the thing that breaks my heart is that she won't have a vacation. That's right. We're just going to sit here and watch our pores open and close. (laughs) The grand music of this whirling monstrosity. 
Well, now, maybe I could take the two of you girls with me. Where are you going? I'm going to conduct the orchestra at the Hotel Wahapinachawaki in the Catskills. <laughs> Wahapinachawaki? Yeah, it's an Indian name. Well, what does it mean? Guests will be charged for all towels taken from the premises. <laughs> if I could only say you girls were musicians. A pretty girl is like a melody that haunts you night and day. I mentioned an Indian name and Hiawatha's grandmother showed up. <laughs> now, don't say anything about the air conditioner. You two are prejudiced. I want to see what Mrs. O'Reilly says. Come in, Mrs. O'Reilly. Hello, girls. Hello, maestro. Greetings. Hmm, I'm getting a warm feeling. I wonder if it could be because I'm near you, maestro. Stick around. You're about to be cooled off, but good. <laughs> what are you talking about? And what are you all doing with blankets folded on your arms? Isn't it early for the football season? Mrs. O'Reilly, look against the wall. Glory be. An organ. You play. <laughs> you play it, maestro, and I'll sing. <laughs> Mrs. O'Reilly, it is not an organ. It's an air conditioner. And it's in the same condition as your voice, broken down. An air conditioner? Yeah, Burma spent all our vacation money for this horrible contraption. Oh, you're not going on a vacation? How can we? Oh, what a pity. You've got to go on a vacation. It's one of a girl's happiest times. Why, I've had some of the most sentimental experiences on this summer vacation. You have? Yes, I don't know what it is, but there's something about getting a man on a boat in the moonlight that tugs at your heartstrings. That's right. That's why they call her Tugboat O'Reilly. <laughs> oh, be still. Janie, would you like to borrow some money? No, Miss O'Reilly. I wouldn't enjoy a vacation knowing I'd borrowed to pay for it. Oh, now, don't be proud, Janie. I have a couple of extra bills in Miss Tuckin. No, thanks, Miss O'Reilly. I have my pride... Irma bought this monstrosity, and I'm going to show her for once that she's going to pay. This will be our beach club. This will be our canoe ride. This will be our dancing in the moonlight. Jane, you better read the directions. This machine can't do all these things. <laughs> oh, go on. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. I'm going in the bedroom, put on my bathing suit, and sit in front of it. Look at the palm trees. Yes, the palm trees. <laughs> Glory be, maestro, did you hear her raving about the palm trees? I was afraid of this. The poor girl has dropped her coconuts. <laughs> Irma, darling. No. Oh, now, please, Irma, you didn't no. mean to it's do it. It's all my fault. I've driven her out of her mind, and I know how she feels. <laughs> <laughs> Chicken. Hello, Al, honey. Chicken, you've been crying. How much can a dame miss a guy? No, Al, it, it isn't that. Jane's angry at me again. Oh, that dame is always picking on you. Why, chicken? Well, I bought that thing against the wall. It's an air conditioner, but it doesn't work too good. The hot is cold and the cold is hot. What about medium? That blows out all the fuses. <laughs> the point is, Al, that Irma spent all the money she and Janie saved for their vacation. Chicken, how could you buy such a thing? Well, must be some way we can unload this machine. And when you back us to the wall, there's only one man to call. Who are you calling, Al? Who else but... Hello, Sam? Sam? Joe's doing time. Sam is watching the store. <laughs> Hello, Sam? Al. Got a deal for you. Oh, by the way, how's Joe doing? What? Looks pretty bad, huh? Might get the hot seat? Got just the thing for him. An air conditioner to cool him off. <laughs> oh, you don't do the buying, huh? Okay, well, thanks anyway. Bye, Sam. Chicken, tried my best. Looks like you're just not going to have a vacation. Well, I gotta run. Well, what's your hurry, Al? I found a trolley transfer punch for nine o'clock, and it's only good for the Bronx. See you, chicken. <laughs> Did you see how he walked out? I'll bet he thinks I'm stupid, too. 
Now, Irma, darling. I know. I've just botched everything up. I've ruined our vacations. Oh, what's the use? Well, oh, this is a fine thing. Jane is in the bedroom crying. Irma's in the kitchen crying. Mrs. O'Reilly, what are we going to do? Maestro, we've got to find a way to raise money so that the two girls can get away and have some fun. All right. Let's go up on the roof and discuss it further. <laughs> All right, but remember, we got to figure out how they should have some fun, not you. Come in, you idiot! Uh, he thinks we're I'm uh, uh, Mr. Clyde. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Who is it? Well, Mrs. O'Reilly and the maestro. <laughs> Hello, cutie. <laughs> uh. What brings the two of you here so early in the morning? Are you uh, eloping? Please, Mr. Clyde, I'm a guest here. Would I insult you in my home? <laughs> well, we wanted to get here early so we could talk to you before Irma gets here. Why? What's wrong with Irma? She took all the money that she and Jane saved for a vacation... And bought a worthless air conditioner. Can you imagine that? Well, that's not too bad for Irma. You see that traffic semaphore at the corner? You mean that thing that says, stop and go? Yes, yeah, she bought that from a traffic cop two years ago so we wouldn't bump into each other when we got busy. <laughs> yes, I, I, I can't believe. Why don't you get rid of it? Oh, she won't let me. When I'm giving her dictation and I go too fast, she puts the stop sign up. <laughs> So, uh, she bought an air conditioner. Yes, and Jane is taking it very badly. Mr. Clyde, we love the girls, and we want to raise some money so they can go on a vacation. Well, I'll be glad to advance Irma two more weeks of salary. That'll take care of October 1st and 15th, 1964. <laughs> no, no, Mr. Clyde, no. Uh, the girls won't borrow money, so we have gotten all of their friends together, and we're going to give a block party and try to raise $300. Oh, I see, I see. Are, are you going to tell Jane about it? Well, we're saying it's for a couple of orphans, but we are worried that the girls might not take the money. Oh, and that's very simple. At the block party, hold a raffle and number every ticket you put in the basket the same as the two numbers you give the girls. When they win, they must accept the two weeks' vacation. Ah, Mr. Clyde, you're a fine man, a warm-hearted man. When you leave this world, I guarantee you'll go straight to heaven. And Irma can tell you exactly the day. <laughs> Shh, shh, here she comes. I'll handle things. Oh, good morning, Mr. Clyde. Good morning. Well, Maestro, Miss O'Reilly. Uh, just a minute, Miss Peterson. I'm in the middle of a discussion. So, Maestro, you say that this block party you're planning is for two little orphans. Yeah. Oh, isn't that sweet? What are they like, Mr. Clyde? Uh, well, uh, one has dark hair and the other one... Poor thing, she's a little mentally retarded. <laughs> she is. Isn't that a shame? Oh, I was that way when I was young. What are their names? Luella. That's uh, Susie. Henrietta. <laughs> I thought you said there were only two. One has a middle name. <laughs> well, uh, Maestro and Mrs. O'Reilly, I'll consider it quite an honor to attend your block party and to buy raffle tickets. You know, raffle tickets? Yes, yeah, certainly. Sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Clyde, and goodbye, Irma. Oh, Maestro, we're only a block from the Marriage License Bureau at City Hall. Which way are we walking? In the opposite direction. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Clyde, I can't tell you how much I admire you for helping in this wonderful work. Do you know these orphans? Well, uh, indirectly. Oh. Do you think the younger one will ever be normal? I doubt it. <laughs> and now, Miss Peterson, would you mind taking another letter? Mr. Clyde, I'm not going to have a vacation. Oh, that's too bad. I don't feel like working. Can I go home because Jane is angry at me? Positively not. Hello, Milton J. Clyde, monster at law. <laughs> How's that again, Cookie? Hello, Jane. You're talking to me. That's right. Well, what are you doing? I'm cooking on the air conditioner. <laughs> I'm making waffles on top and frozen sherbet underneath. <laughs> Irma, when you come home, we've got a lot of things to do. What do you mean? The gang's giving a block party for two little orphans, and we've got to pitch in, honey. Oh, yes, I heard about the block party. Miss Peterson, if she wants you to leave, you can leave right now. Huh? That's perfectly all right. You go on. Go on home. Yeah, I don't understand. Uh, Jane, I'll be right home. Bye. 
You know, Mr. Platt, I don't understand you. What do you mean? Well, I worked for you for six years, and when I asked to go home, you said no. That's right. But when you hear it's about two little orphans you don't even know, they get all your attention and sympathy. Well, I'm telling you right now, I'm not killing my parents just for you. <laughs> well, uh, there's no point in doing it now. Before you were born, yes. Goodbye, Miss Peterson. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Martin. Oh, Jane, isn't this exciting? Really, things are happening so suddenly, I don't know what to make of it. Well, Janey, dear, it's an emergency. That's why we're holding a block party today. We've got to work fast. Now, Violet, you know how to read palms? That's right. Well, what do you think's a fair price to charge the gentleman? Well, I generally charge 50 cents, and I get it in advance. Because after I hold their hands for a while... I forget to collect the money. Well, well, that's taken care of. I think I'll run the kissing booth. (laughs) Mrs. O'Reilly, this cannot help orphans. This can only make widows because all men will kill themselves. Oh, Oh, and I'd like to do my share. Can I prepare the food? No, two orphans are enough. We don't want to make any more. (laughs) By the way, is the street going to be roped off so that no traffic comes through? I took care of that. I went down to the police station myself. You know, I know the boys. I told them I'd be selling kisses, and they said they'd be glad to rope off the street. (laughs) Now, I know there's a compliment in there someplace. (laughs) You know something? When this gang gets together to help somebody, boy, oh boy, there's nothing like it. And it couldn't be for a worthier cause. No, Jane, it couldn't. Oh, really, Mrs. Rhinelander? How nice. I can't tell you. Now, now, Jane, when Richard told me all about those two little orphan girls, I just felt that I had to be here. (laughs) Oh, do you mind if I sit down? Perhaps it was walking up and down the stairs, but I suddenly feel hot and cold flushes. (laughs) Not the stairs. Irma, turn off that infernal machine. It could make a monkey out of a death ray. (laughs) Okay, I will. Oh, and Mrs. Rhinelander, I just can't tell you how sweet it is of you to come and help us. I only wish that someday you'll be an orphan so we can return the compliment. <laughs> well, look who's here, Mrs. Rhinelander. You got me message? Yes, I did. You, sweetheart. And to show you how I appreciate it, since I'm running the kissing booth, I'll let you assist me in case we get any elderly customers. <laughs> oh, Kathleen, you're priceless. Yeah, well, it's getting time to start the proceedings. Uh, uh, Jane uh, and Irma, would you go and... Uh... Uh, pick up the food from Schultz's Delicatessen. Oh, sure. Come on, honey. Well, why do the both of us have to go? Yeah, well, it, it's uh, it's heavy. It's pretty heavy. You see, I uh, I ordered 50 pounds of Swiss cheese. Well, 50 pounds of Swiss cheese only weighs about 10 pounds. You know, most of it is all holes. Come on, Irma. <laughs> Good work, maestro. Now they're gone. Al, did you have the raffle tickets printed? Yep, here they are. All right, let me see that. The benefit black party for orphans. First and second prize, two weeks vacation. Good, good. Uh, do you have the wicker basket? Yep, got it. Great. Now everybody at the black party will get one of these tickets with each purchase. We will see that Jane and Irma get number 10 and number 11. Every ticket in the wicker basket is number 10 or 11. What a great setup. Too bad it's so honest. How much do you think we'll raise? Well, I've run a lot of charity affairs in my day, but I've never seen such spirit. I think we should raise $600. Would that include the kissing booth? Yeah, yeah, and with refunds, we should wind up with $400. Now, you be still. All right, Violet, you get to your booth, and remember, we are counting on you for a big take. Don't worry, I'll collect the money in advance. Uh, Mrs. Rhinelander, you come with me. <laughs> and bring a first aid kit in case any of the men swoon. <laughs> I'll get my orchestra ready for the dancing. Maestro, don't forget to save a dance for me at the block party. Yeah, I've already opened the manhole cover. Let's go. <laughs> Well, folks, 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 
the block party's over. You've all had a good time, and now we'd like to have the drawing. The first two prizes are two weeks' vacations to the two winners. Now, Mrs. O'Reilly, will you please take a ticket out of the basket? All right. Here it is. Number 10. Number 10. Who has number 10? Irma, what'd you do with our tickets? I threw them away. We've no car to park. Oh. <laughs> oh, Irma, how could you? Wait a minute. Here they are, all wrinkled up in my pocket. Here's yours, Jenny. Oh. Uh, who has number 10? Here it is. I've got 10. 10. Oh, 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 That's oh, 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 wonderful. And now? Now, Mrs. O'Reilly, will you draw the second winning number? All right. Number ten. Number ten. Number ten. Number ten. Number ten. Oh, here it is, number eleven. Who has number eleven? <laughs> oh, gosh, not me. I've just got two ones. What? <laughs> Hey, hey, now, Sorry. hey, wait a minute. Now, what's going on here, Mrs. O'Reilly? Maestro? Miss Rylander, what are you trying to do? You said this block party was for two orphans. Janie, dear, what have you been to him? A uh, mother, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I have, yeah. And if you left her like you threatened, what would she be? An orphan. An Irma? Yes. Now, these various things you do, like buying the air conditioner... Now, what, what do you think it's doing to Janie? Sometimes I'm afraid she'll kill herself. What would that make you? An orphan. You see, we didn't lie. <laughs> we, we love you, Janie, and I, man, it was the least we could do. Oh, you shouldn't. Oh, really, you shouldn't. Oh, to have such friends. Oh, gosh. Well, I guess there's only one thing we can do now. Yes. Let's go and sit in front of the air conditioner and dry our tears. <laughs> An Armed Forces Radio recording of My Friend Irma from 71 years ago, June 30th, 1953, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Coming up next, Superman. In time of disaster, natural or nuclear, medical aid may not be available. That's why one member of each family should take a Red Cross first aid or home nursing course now. Learn about Civil Defense at CivilDefenseMuseum.com. CivilDefenseMuseum.com. Now, we hear from Bud Collier as Clark Kent, Jackie Kelk as Jimmy Olsen in this episode of Superman from 83 years ago, June 30th, 1941, the continuing story of The White Plague. Presenting the transcription feature, Superman! <laughs> It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can leap tall buildings of a single bound, race a speeding bullet to its target, then steal in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth. And justice. And now to our story. Things have taken a serious turn at the Bartlett logging camp deep in the North Woods, where Clark Kent and young Jimmy Olsen are involved in a baffling mystery. Not only have four lumberjacks met death at unknown hands, but the legend of the White Plague, said to be responsible for the death, now seems to be seeking vengeance from Kent and Jimmy. When we last saw them, they were driving a horse-drawn sled back to the camp, a sled carrying the lifeless body of a lumberjack who had suddenly and mysteriously collapsed. Without warning, a rifle began blazing at them from the woods adjoining the trail. <coughs> Shouting to Jimmy to keep low, Kent sent the horse into a gallop as steel-jacketed bullets whined about his head. Stay down, Jimmy. Whoever's handling that rifle means business. Get up, boy. Be careful, Mr. Kent. You get hit. Don't worry about me. Hey, stop shooting. Yeah, but keep low until you get around this bend. Ah, okay, I guess we can pull up. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's a close call. Who do you think it was, Mr. Kent? I don't know, Jimmy. 
But if they think we're going to take this lying down, they're crazy. They can believe that the White Plague kills off people mysteriously if they want to, but the White Plague doesn't shoot a high-powered rifle. You know, I'd almost swear that a couple of those bullets bounced off your back. Oh, now look here, Jimmy. Well, I admit it's impossible, but that's how it seems. Every time there was a shot, I heard the bullet whiz by. Every time except twice. Then there was a little thump, and he sort of stiffened up and... Oh, forget it. I'm just nuts. I'm beginning to think so. Well, what do we do now? No sense sitting here. We might just as well go on to the camp. I'd like to sneak back and see if I can find some trace of whoever was shooting at us. Well, let him have another shot at you? I know you've got a lot of courage and all that, but good grief, you're not Superman. Oh, no? I mean... Oh, no, no, of course not. Well, let's head for the camp, but don't mention this shooting incident to anyone, Jimmy. Not even to Mr. Harmon? Not even to Mr. Harmon. He has plenty to worry about as it is. Let's keep it quiet for a while. Okay. Get up, boy. Come on. Get up. Get up. Oh, that fire sure feels good after spending most of the day watching your men chop trees, Mr. Harmon. Yes, I suppose it does. Kent, I'm at the end of my rope. This last train, Sam Green's death, is all I can stand. I'm riding into town tonight to wire Mr. Bartlett that I'm closing up. You can't do that, Mr. Harmon. That's quitting in the face of a little trouble. You call this a little trouble? Four men dead under strange circumstances and every human being in the camp in deadly fear that he'll be next? You call that a little trouble? Well, I admit it's puzzling, but there must be a solution. This nonsense about the White Plague seeking vengeance on your men because they've been cutting trees with snow-covered roots is so much childish superstition. Yes, I know. But you can't convince the men of that. Some of them are getting ready to leave now. What does Dawson say? What can he say? Bill doesn't believe it any more than you or I do, but he's helpless. Matter of fact, you and young Jimmy have no right staying here. What if something happened to either one of you? Oh, nothing's going to happen to us. By the way, where is Jimmy? Why, well, Nancy took him out back to show him the baby raccoon she penned up. Oh. Come in. Oh, it's you, Olaf. Yeah, I bring back right from Mr. Harmon. All right, just set it in the corner with the others, Olaf. Thank you. And uh, if you see Mr. Dawson, Olaf, ask him to step in. Yeah, Mr. Harmon, I do. Was he one of the felling crew Dawson had out this morning, Mr. Harmon? The crew Sam Green was with? Yes. Where did he get the rifle? Why, each crew takes one along in case of wolves or bears. And that rifle went along with Dawson's crew? Now, I'm sorry, Kent, but frankly, I'm in no state of mind to answer unimportant questions. What difference does it make what rifle went with what crew? Haven't we more important things to think about? I wonder. Where are you going, Kent? Which of these rifles did that Swede just return? Uh, well, the one on the right. This one? Yes. Uh, here, smell this barrel. Burnt powder. This rifle's been shot recently. Well, what of it? Is there any law against firing a rifle? Yes, if you fire it at human beings. What are you talking about, Kent? Well, I hadn't intended telling you this for fear of worrying you further, but someone tried to kill Jimmy and myself today, Mr. Harmon. What? But Kent, you don't mean that. I'm afraid I do. When we were driving the sled back to camp, someone fired at us from the woods with a rifle. This rifle. Someone fired at you? Yes, quite a number of shots. But why, Ken? Well, oh, that's not important at the moment. What is important is that this rifle was used to fire the shots. You can't be sure of that. We have four rifles in camp, all of them the same make. They may have all been fired today. At wolves. Well, we can find out, can't we? The crew Jimmy and I were with had no reason for using a rifle. That is, up to the time we left. Suppose you call that Swedish logger back. He should know whether the rifle was used. It's a good idea, Ken. I'll put my Mackinac on and get him. This is simply terrible. I'll be right back. I wonder whether the person who used this rifle was smart enough to reload it. Well, only one way to find out. Hmm, there's a brand new full five-shot clip in here. He was smart enough. But he didn't bother to clean the barrel, and that's what may hang all this on him. 
Well, you didn't waste any time, Mr. Harmon. There isn't any to waste. Olaf, this is Mr. Kent. Aben, glad to meet you, Mr. Kent. How do you do, Olaf? That's the rifle you just returned, isn't it, Olaf? The one Mr. Kent is holding? Yeah, I I think so. It's the one you brought back a few minutes ago and placed in the corner? Yeah, yeah. Was that rifle used today, Olaf? You mean was shot, Mr. Harmon? Yes, I mean shot. Oh, no, that's the rifle she know was shot today. No, no. Are you sure, Olaf? I've been sure, used like I've been sure. My name Olaf Johnson. Nobody shot this rifle? Yeah. You mean somebody did shoot it? Oh, no, no. You you got me twisted, Mr. Harmon. Uh, Kent, hmm? you'd better take over. I I can't even think straight. Olaf, you say the rifle wasn't shot all day, is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you know it wasn't shot? Where was it? Laying on stump. I can see it 20 times, maybe. I understand. You saw the rifle leaning against the stump. All right, but someone might have picked it up and shot it. No, no. Did you hear any rifle shots this afternoon? Yeah. Oh, but you're sure they didn't come from this gun? Yeah. Huh. Well, Mr. Harmon, either he's lying or he's mistaken. Oh, left, never lie. What do you mean when you say that? Now, say, take it easy, old. Mr. Kent didn't say that you lied. Yeah, I've been here. He may know us deaf. I punch him in his nose. I'm sorry, Olaf. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I hurt your face with punching nose if you say Olaf tell lie. All right, Olaf. All right. You can go now. Uh, Olaf say rifle no shot. Rifle no shot. A no tell lie. Well, I always knew Swedes were sensitive, but not that sensitive. Well, now what, Kent? Looks like we're up against the blank wall again. While you were getting Olaf, I examined the rifle, Mr. Harmon. Whoever used it took the precaution of reloading it with a new clip of cartridges. That convinces me this was the gun employed. Well, assuming that it is, what good does that knowledge do us unless we know who pulled the trigger? I wish Dawson would get here. Maybe he knows the answer to this. Well, didn't he come back with the crew? Yes, but a nice jam developed on the river. We went down to blow it out. Oh. We're due to float 10,000 feet downstream tonight because it must reach the mill by next week. Well, he should be back shortly. Kent, I don't think I can stand much more of this. Oh, now, buck up, Mr. Harmon. It'll straighten out. I suppose so. In the meantime, I... I can't take it. I'm not as young as I'd like to be when trouble starts brewing. I've had my share of it all my life and managed to squeeze by, but when you're going on 55, Kent, you feel as though you've got a right to sit back, relax. Well, you'll get that chance, I'm sure. I'm worried about Nancy, Kent. When I take things hard, it upsets her terribly. I know she hasn't slept a wink these last few nights. I hear her get up, come out, and sit by the fire. Not right. Oh. Hey, by the way, where are Jimmy and Nancy? I didn't realize it, but it's almost dark. Why, I told you, they went out to look at the raccoons. Yes, but that was almost an hour ago. Where are the raccoons? The wire pen, out and back. Here, this way. Hmm. Yeah, there's the pen, next to that shed. Well, I don't see either of them. Jimmy! They may have walked down around the cabins. And she knows my whistle. She'll answer it. <whistles> That's funny. I'm going to look for them. It'll be pitch dark soon. Now, wait a minute, Kent. Look at these footprints in the snow around the pen. One set is Nancy's, and the other set must be Jimmy's. Yes, it is. We can follow them. Come on. Where do they lead to? Back of the shed. What there? Nothing but a little cleared land and a pine woods. Well, the prints are headed right for the woods. I don't like this, Kent. Nancy would never wander away like this. Wait a minute. Hold up. All right. What is it, Kent? Look. They never got to the woods. The footprints end here, right out in the open. No, they... They must have gone back or turned off. Those are the only footprints in the snow besides our own. But Kent, it's impossible. They couldn't just vanish. Where could they have gone? And according to these footprints, there's only one place they could have gone. Up in the air. Now, what strange, baffling thing has happened to add to the mystery surrounding the logging camp? Where did Jimmy and Nancy Harmon vanish to, and how is it possible that their footprints in the snow ended abruptly? Can you figure it out? If you can't, don't fail to listen to the next episode of Superman. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. Bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. 
Exceedingly strange, but you're going to have to wait two days to find out. June 30th, 1941, The White Plague. Superman, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We'll have Superman again on Tuesday. And tomorrow, Gunsmoke, Fort Laramie, Roy Rogers, Dimension X, and Claudia. I'm Wyatt Cox. Thanks for being with us. For more Classic Radio Theater, see you tomorrow.